BLM activist John Earl Sullivan has been convicted for his role in incitement on January 6th. That is right. This is a BLM far left activist. And the funny thing about it is we all know the media has a, uh, has in the past reported on his activities. We know that he was a frequent uh, um, uh, attendee and organizer for many leftist rallies. We know that's on video. He's cheering for what's happening at the Capitol. And uh, now we've got the corporate press saying he's an anti-establishment activist. Right. Because now they're trying to deflect from the fact that he's a Black Lives Matter supporter. And that was basically what it was all about. He even said in the uh, there's video of him from that from that day where he's saying, I don't I'll be on anybody's side if they're going to tear it all down, yada, yada, yada. So that's going to be uh, uh, interesting how we see liberals in the left respond to this, considering well, for a long time, a lot of conservatives said there were anti there were leftists there. Now it's one guy. So we'll see. But we also got to talk about what's going on with TikTok, because this is a wild story that's been going off since yesterday. TikTok has been promoting videos where leftists say they read Osama bin Laden's letter to America and that they believe he was correct. I don't think any of these people actually read the thing because he's basically lamenting how U.S. foreign policy is preventing Sharia law from taking hold on the planet and how he wants all of the West to come to Islam. And uh, I think if they actually read maybe even like the first paragraph where Osama bin Laden says that you have to abandon fornication, homosexuality, gambling and usury, they might be like, wait, I don't know if we agree with this guy, but Sure enough, now we're getting news that TikTok is going to start banning all of these things. So it's a wild story. We'll definitely talk about that and a whole lot more. Before we get started, my friends, head over to castbrew.com and buy Cast Brew Coffee. Why? It's the best cup of coffee you'll ever have. We got our limited edition re-rise with Roberto Jr. available right now. It's our Halloween blend. And uh, we have the, the zombified chicken foot rising from the earth. So uh, pick up that bag while you still can, because once they're gone, they're gone forever. And uh, we, did a, we did an initial run of 5,000 of these. But of course, the mo- everyone's favorite is Rise with Roberto Jr., a light roast, then Appalachian Nights, the dark roast, and Stand Your Grounds. we got K-Cups. When you support Casper Coffee, you're supporting the work we do here, but also our efforts to build coffee shops and create physical spaces in Meat World where you can talk to people, share ideas, and build community. Also, don't forget to head over to TimCast.com, click join us, become a member, because I'm pretty sure the members only after show is going to be fairly lit considering our guests. So smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Joining us tonight to talk about this and a whole lot more, we got Dave Smith. What's up? Good to be back. Who are you? Uh, I am a uh, stand-up comedian, a podcaster, a soldier in the Ron Paul army, and a destroyer of loomers. <laughs> <laughs> You had a debate with Laura Loomer the other day. I did. Yeah. It was a it was a fun time. Uh, thank you. Uh, shout out to Zero Hedge uh, for putting that thing on. Uh, that was a fun. It was a fun time. And Zero Hedge is a cool publication, so it was cool to do. It was like the first in like a debate series that yeah, they're that's launching. Great. So it's cool to yeah. do it. Yeah. Plus, yeah. we got uh, Clint Russell hanging out. Clint Russell, host of Liberty Lockdown, co-host of Tower Gang, co-host of the best political show over on Rumble with Luke Rutkowski, if you can believe it. it can't be uh, that good. It's it's pretty good. <laughs> it's it's actually, it's the best, Seamus. I know Potato Man doesn't believe me, but it's true. Uh, yeah, we we just signed a deal with Rumble. We're very grateful for that. And uh, you guys can actually check us out. We're going to have Jackson Hinkle on this Sunday, 6 o'clock. Don't miss it. Just search We Are Change, all one word on Rumble. You'll love it. I don't know. That Luke guy sounds foreign. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is. He's actually, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's, a person he's an of interesting color. Polish person. He is a, yeah, he is a person of color. Yeah, sl- uh, Polish Slavic. people are, uh, they Slavic. really are. This Not is that a- I have issue. I actually like Polish people. It's, it, no, that's why I'm so disappointed by him. I actually <laughs> really love Polish food. I, I tend no, to like, like Polish him. food. It's, it's, uh, it's the best. It's so yeah, a lot of what they do. No, yeah, Poland's fantastic. Yeah. Poland's well, Seamus is, uh, is back. I'm again. a cartoonist. Yes. My name is Seamus Coglin. Also, I've, I've been on Clint's show and it is very, very good. I actually enjoyed thank it very you, much. You. So I, I will, uh, concede that, but that was before the new co-host. Um, <laughs> I have a YouTube channel called freedom tunes. We create animated cartoons about politics and the culture war. We released a cartoon today that I'm super happy with everyone working on it. Uh, their, their talents shine through. It's, I think it's one of the funniest videos we've made. Um, and it's, it's a, a parody of like those red pill guys who will like find a beautiful young couple on a date and then be like, what are you bringing to the table? <laughs> um, and it's, it's a fun one. I'm, it's really I, good. Yeah. Th- yeah. T- Tim got to see it while it was in progress <laughs> the other day. So if you guys want to check that out, go over to, uh, freedom tunes on YouTube, subscribe, hit the notification bell. I love y'all. I'm looking forward to a good show. I, did they record the, uh, debate between you and Laura Loomer? Yeah. Uh, zero hedge put it out on their, uh, Twitter uh or x uh uh feed or whatever and uh i think laura loomer put it out on her rumble i'm gonna be moderating the next zero hedge debate 
Oh, yeah. So okay. that'll be with, uh, I don't know if it's official who it is yet or what it's on, so I'm not going to mention it now, but it's going to be Trump versus Biden. It's going to be in the next couple <laughs> yeah. of weeks. And as soon as I get the green light that it's all confirmed and everything, I'll start telling everybody what's what, but keep an eye open. Could you imagine Ian moderating a debate between those two? Like Sorry, he would just ask them questions. They had no idea what was going on. They'd be like, I don't know. What's your graphic policy? Amazing. Did you guys have a moderator? Uh, yeah, we had uh, Adam uh, from uh, Patrick Pet David's. Uh, oh, Adam uh, Sosnick. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. He was who, and he he was great too. Yeah, I, I love Adam. He's a great guy. Uh, and so, yeah, he did. He did a very good job. Right cool. Well, well we got to checking it out. We got Surge pressing the buttons. Yes, I'm here. Uh, it's good to see you, Dave, and good to see you too as well, Clint. Uh, and also to see you too, Seamus. So I know I was there seeing yeah. you last night. Didn't know you'd be here today. I know. Yeah, it's great seeing you as well, man. Yeah. Cheers. Anyways, let's get into it, guys. Here's a story from the post millennial far left BLM activist John Sullivan convicted on all charges in the January 6th case. Sullivan said he was only at the Capitol to document the event. This is really interesting because. Uh, He's a prominent BLM activist who was there during court testimony. He said he was only there to document. I was only observing. I followed the crowd. I'm here to document. Sullivan's testimony was followed up by prosecutors who played multiple videos of Sullivan urging on the mob, which included a self declaration to make Trump supporters F ish up. I'm going to side with anyone who is ready to rip this ish down. Sullivan said in one video, I brought my megaphone to instigate ish. He said in another video. NBC News reports that prosecutors portrayed Sullivan as an anti-establishment activist who had the goal to burn it all down. Now, I have to wonder, here's NBC News saying anti-establishment activists sought to incite Trump supporters on January 6th, DOJ argues. But of course, I want to make sure we can bring up John Earl Sullivan's Wikipedia page. He's got one where they mention he organized and participated in protests relating to Black Lives Matter, though a few other BLM organizers explicitly disavowed him. I don't think that matters. That's what uh, his, his ideology was. They say he entered the Capitol and accidentally broke a window. He repeatedly shouted encouragement to fellow rioters. And they go on to outright outline the things that uh, uh, he, he, he does. And ultimately his claims of being a journalist. I believe CNN paid him, uh, what did they pay him, 50 grand? Something like that for his footage. Had him on TV. Here's what's fascinating. Here's why I think they're not calling him far left. For one, there's absolutely NBC News. They're, they're super biased. But we're talking about a federal federal charge here. Do, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, actually, I believe it's, it is D.C., right? Are you going to convict a Black Lives Matter supporter on January 6th by telling a jury that this guy was a Black Lives Matter supporter? Mm -hmm. And so the strategy of the prosecutors is if we go to the jury and say he's BLM, they acquit him. And if they acquit him, then they got to quit everybody. Well, so so he's just being the charges are being brought against him, right? He hasn't been convicted. Convicted on all. Oh, he was counts. convicted. Okay, my mistake. Yep. Okay, and then do you uh, does it say anything about like what obviously hasn't been sentenced yet, but what type of jail time he's looking at for this? Uh, well, here's the interesting thing. I mean, because he, breaking a window is what that uh the proud boy or yeah, whatever yeah, got yeah. that got him like 50, 15, 17 years 17, or whatever it was right. and they the argument was that they were like well by breaking a window this wasn't just oh you broke a government window it was you created an opening for a mob that would then oh be trying to I mean, overthrow the government so i'm just saying what because for the record whatever yo, this he guy's, was armed well whatever this guy was armed he, on he January armed, the, armed the knife okay and they even point out that he drew the knife in uh, on the house uh, wait wait he he drew his knife as riders were trying to breach the house floor well i didn't realize this guy was a hero i'm just kidding i'm just kidding that's a joke youtube it's a total joke and i don't mean that literally but you know get my point anyway um well i'm just saying what like i because if they're going first off if they're going to throw the book at this guy in that way i still would think that's insane as i do with all the january 6th protesters what's really interesting about this is the question of which i don't know if it's clear what is this guy? Hey, I'm just so anti-establishment. I'm a burn it all down when there's Black Lives Matter rally guy. And I'm a burn it all down when there's J6 type guys. Or is this what I think a lot of the right wingers were more suspicious of initially after January 6th, that this is somebody who's trying to make the pro Trump movement look bad by instigating all of them to do something that then could be spun as like, yeah, look how horrible the pro-Trump people are. Could be both, because if if Black Lives Matter was disavowing this guy before the January 6th thing even went off, he might have been it's a kill two birds with one stone situation where he's like, yo, I can F the government and I can get all these people thrown in jail and get them to commit crimes. And then I can 
you know, do away with two. Well, Who knows? He just sounds like a radical that went too far. I don't know if you guys remember this, but prior to January of 2021, the left was not shy about openly embracing insurrectionist rhetoric. I remember during the BLM rights, there were left wingers who were saying all these right wing hypocrites spent years saying they have the Second Amendment to rebel against tyranny and overthrow the U.S. government. And now that the government is just indiscriminately killing unarmed black people, which is, of course, a lie. But that's what they were saying. These right wingers won't rise up against this state. And then as soon as January uh 6th 2021 happens oh my gosh insurrection is the most serious problem in this country and we need to call these people traitors and throw them in prison so it wouldn't surprise me that you actually might have a left-wing activist saying yeah i'll join with these right-wingers try to overthrow the government or try to instigate instigate right-wingers to overthrow the government i want to crank this thing all the way up to 11 right now if i may and just say civil war all right everybody's been waiting i haven't said it in a few months so i feel like i'm (laughs) it's it's due but no let me explain I i don't literally mean to say civil war but I'd like for you guys to give me your thoughts on the other day we saw David DePap testify. This is the guy who attacked Paul Pelosi in his testimony. He claimed that he was a leftist who was radicalized by right wing conspiracy theories watching YouTube of that. He included me, Glenn Beck, James Lindsay. Dinesh Souza made a good point that this is a narrative where they go to them and say they go to these these people who are being charged like the J6ers and say, blame Trump, blame the right and do this. I think there's a really simple reason why that's the case. You're in San Francisco. You are in the bluest of blue. And the defense says to you, listen, you will not win because you attacked Paul Pelosi. However, the best sympathy you will get is if you claimed you were radicalized by the far right mm. and that you, you, oh, no, what have they done to me? It's the evil right that did it. Try and earn some sympathy in that way. The reason why they're arguing this guy in a federal case in D.C. is anti-establishment and not far left, once again, is for that exact same reason. Now, what happens is. You are you are getting through these high profile cases in San Francisco. I'm seeing these people post saying, oh, look, James Lindsay, Tim Pool, Glenn Beck. Oh, they they radicalize this guy. It's, it's a lie. It's nonsense. And but it's creating that terrifying boogeyman. It's creating that bifurcation. If prosecute prosecutors in high profile cases are keep are they going to keep playing this narrative of Donald Trump is radicalizing people to extremes? Anytime someone commits an, uh, some kind of extreme act, even a BLM supporter, they're going to blame the far right or the quote-unquote far right, they're creating a, a narrative that young people who are entering the political space will believe we live in this world. So real quick, as an example. It's a really, it's a really interesting point that you bring up. I, I, can I just say, like, because I think that's such a good point and such an interesting thing to, to focus on, because like as a, as a libertarian, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot is that, like, look, we, we don't think government should be in the business of kind of micromanaging culture and things like this. But you also recognize that you need other forces like you need kind of a virtuous culture yeah. in order for that to work. And I think one of the things I've been thinking this a lot, like since all these uh, these insane indictments have been coming down against Donald Trump, when you look at like kind of the landscape of current day America, you go, how could a guy like Donald Trump ever get a fair trial? I mean, if you have a jury trial with Donald Trump, uh, whoever the jury pool is, it's like a 50-50 shot that they either think he is Jesus or Satan. And how could how could anyone who has either one of those opinions ever be an honest juror? And I think kind of the point you're making here is that like, look, in the reality today of a modern jury trial with the polarization of the country and this white hot culture war, you almost, yeah, man, if you're on trial in San Francisco, it's almost like the only way That's to right. tailor but your defense is to try to have it something that hugs a left wing sympathy. Let me let me add to what you said. You said 50 50. Uh, let's say 33. Sure. 30. sure. But, but, but no, no, yeah. no, no. Here's what I mean. 33 percent are say Trump's Hitler. 33 are going to say Trump is good. And 33 are going to say, holy crap, I better side with the left. Otherwise, Antifa is going to show up to my house. <laughs> right, and beat right. me to death. Yep. Yeah, okay, no, but, fair enough. But, but it's an interesting point, right? Because people who were uh, charged in relationship to January 6th or because of activities they engage in on January 6th are tried in Washington, D.C. as if that's a jury of their peers. I'm sorry, if you came from Arkansas, D.C. leftists are that's not a jury of your peers. That's people. The jury of your political, enemies. Exactly. People with a specific political bias who well, hate you in your way of life. Hold on. I mean, think about what you're saying here. Other Americans are your enemies. Oh yeah. boy. So, so when I'm when no, I'm, no, when no, I'm no, like, not other Americans, people in Washington D.C. Let's, just be, <laughs> let's but, be clear about this. But I get it. But like the, the 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 genuine sentiment is, if you are from, look, I brought this up yesterday when we were talking about the DePap thing. We had a legal issue against a major corporation, and my lawyer said, okay, well, if you sue in California or New York, New York you'll lose. The the Democrat judge is already going to hate you, Tim Pool. And outside of that. They're going to be way more pro-corporate and they're not going to care about your rights. 
You sue in West Virginia, you're going to win overnight. Why? Well, you're in West Virginia. They like you, Tim Pool. Mm, and I'm yeah. like, is that really all that it is? Yes. So, uh, selecting the proper venue is the is like one of the most important things, especially today, if not the most important thing. I have, I have a bit of a different angle on this. I think that the uh, the the real concern that I have is that you have these commentators that are being categorized, like your my friend Tim here, uh, along with James Lindsay and others, that they're trying to kind of lay out the groundwork for this stochastic terrorism argument, where you're being uh, you know pushed into radicalism by people who are just speaking freely, and then you're now in some in some way uh what's a, what's the word exculcated uh where, where basically your, your your personal responsibility is removed because you've been inspired by this radical tim pool or mm-hmm. alex jones or whatever and it just it really because of the where we're at oh, it, that, that's a real thing and yeah. look they've come at you before with that wasn't what was the other that young turks uh chick tried to like come at you about how uh some shooter oh, no, liked no, no, one was, of your uh, videos or something like that. So they're no, not Young Turks. I'm sorry. My uh, mistake. Jordan Cedar. Cedar's, yeah, uh, that's uh, right. First, so that was yeah, yeah. Uh, the guy in Texas who uh, on his Facebook had posted four screenshots of one episode and one specific portion of one episode. And it actually showed he like wasn't one, a subscriber. Which is a, it's such a crazy thing because when you have a show like, look, like uh, you have a show like with this size audience, which you've built up a very big platform here. The idea that any one person who one time liked one clip on this, you're now on the hook. It's literally, it's almost on the well, level of like, well, this this mass shooter watched Friends. It's so, insane. I mean, well, I think I think obviously Ross and Rachel are the reason why he shot up there. But the, the other thing about it that's crazy is that look, Phoebe when, when was you, the one that radicalized when me. You, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, she's, she's the one. If it was day. on that show, she was the one. She was, but like, yeah. if you actually kind of live in this world of like I do consider myself to be a radical, politically speaking. I'm pretty radically outside of what the current status quo is. But when you're in this world, it's kind of my uh, my my good friend Michael Malice, good friend of the show. He used to always say, and I really loved this uh, when he would go, "I hope left wingers understand that the NRA are the moderates on this <laughs> yeah. issue," because it really is like if you're not in that world, I yeah. know they paint it as like that's like the crazy extreme, but that's not. They're, the NRA is up there like. All we need to do is enforce existing gun laws, <laughs> and you're like, "Wow, that's so extreme!" And you're like, "Extreme." The Constitution like, I'm, is like, "Shall well, not infringe." Yes, like, the, but, but the, the point is that if you're actually talking about a radical show, like a show, and I'm not even not radical in the way I am, I'm radically like nonviolent and peaceful. Uh-oh. If you were talking about a show that was going to amp you up to go like murder people. This is not that show. Well, let me, let me There's ask crazy people out there on the internet, and this is not that. Real quick question. Do you think individual citizens have the right to keep and bear biological weapons? Well, well I, we're getting a little out there yes. with biological weapons. I'd Hands say, down, unequivocally, I'd yes. say, well, it depends on what the biological I mean, weapon COVID. is, how it's there. I mean, uh, I, it depends on exactly what your definition Nuclear of that weapons. is. I draw my line at nukes. I don't. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, you no. Look, I think if you were to have uh, th- this is a serious question. I if you were to have, I, I, I will say unequivocally, the Constitution uh, uh, guarantees our right to keep and bear arms. It doesn't define what arms are. Private citizens to this day own nuclear weapons through their corporations, and back then owned warships. Nothing's changed. Yeah. So right now, to this day, it's not even controversial to say, except in the in these podcasts. Liberals get shocked that I would say this, and I'm like, do you think Raytheon is a government operation? Yes, no, look, so in that case, you're absolutely right. There could be an argument made that if you were uh, if you were possessing uh, chemical weapons and were keeping them like in a in a very risky way that could hurt a lot of other people, then you should be maybe liable for the fact that you're putting other people yeah, see, at risk. I stop but you. in theory, in theory, I would tend because to agree is, with you. This is the argument they make about proper gun storage and stuff like this. Like you can only have a gun if it's separate from the ammo and in your trunk and not in your, you know, not in the same. Yeah, compartment. yeah. So then the question is where you do draw the line. But at the same point, if you had a gun that you left out, that the difference between like a nuke or, or chemical weapons and a gun is that a nuke, if you're just keeping it in a way where it could just detonate at any moment, is actually a threat to other people. Whereas a gun, someone actually has to pick it up and point the trigger and shoot it. Anyway, I'm Brand- all for Brand- no, no no restrictions. Brand- Brandishing a weapon, if you're like waving it around at people on wrongly, yes, it's right. Activity. So you could you could yeah. think maybe there's an don't try to out anarchist me. Tim. Tim. <laughs> he, he's I'm doing not going to lose this. <laughs> battle, this battle. I will I will yeah. say let me just say real quick. Uh, I I do agree with the sentiment. Obviously, I don't want the government regulating any weaponry that I can own. However, I go the opposite direction where I say 
uh, humanity ought to be working towards nuclear disarmament, broadly speaking. So I'm not interested in having civilians have them. I'm more interested in getting the federal government to have far less. Wait, yes. I, wait, wait, the the think, goal should be to disarm federal governments. Yes. That should I, be the goal. Yes. I think every every person on the planet should have a, a nuke, perhaps a MERV with, you know, a 12 uh, warhead MERV. And because a nuclear armed uh, individual, an individually nuclear armed society is, in, is a very polite, <laughs> a polite society. I'm kidding. Yeah. I am kidding. A extraordinarily polite. <laughs> extraordinary. Yeah. Or glowing. Either way. <laughs> it's, uh, have you read anyway, John, anyway. John Lott's book, More Nukes, Less Crime? <laughs> it's, uh, it's good. A lot of good stats in there. <laughs> anyway, stuff. what were we talking about before I decided to ask about that? Uh, January oh, yeah, 6th. We were talking about the yes. courts and how the courts have basically turned into, if you're in a conservative district, you know what? A leftist is going to get a fair trial. Not as, as fair as like... It's hard to say fair, fair. Um, a leftist in a conservative district is going to get a decent trial. Definitely a conservative better. Conservative in a better leftist off, yeah. trial is going to get tarred, feathered, strung up for, for jaywalking or farting. Donald Trump could fart in public, and they're going to get him on some nonsense and, and lock him up. But, but he, yeah, the yeah. truth the truth is that that leftist dogma is is so much a prerequisite for all of academia at this point. If you if you have to rely on any institution for your freedom. You're in a lot of trouble at this point. Yeah. P politically, uh, in, in academia, obviously, now in the judiciary as well. It, it's not getting any better either because they have had 100 years of infiltration into these, uh, you know, mind creation uh, institutions. So, yeah, we're, we have an uphill well, battle. I think the like the only caveat, and I agree with what you're saying, Tim. I think there is there there is a point there that it's not equal kind of on, on both sides. But I guess part of the difference there, too, is that, look, there is, let's say in right wing or red America, I think there is a tremendous amount, and I would argue justifiably, but a tremendous amount of like resentment towards, say, the political establishment the de particularly the Democratic Party establishment. So the the thing is, I don't I don't know that in this moment of this hot culture war, I don't know that Hillary Clinton could get a fair trial in rural Alabama. But the thing is that Hillary Clinton is never going to face charges exactly. in yeah. rural Alabama, yep. right? Like the the federal government or different state governments or different like if there were some like conservative financier who's financing, you know, conservative prosecutors doesn't exist. Is never, right. Yeah. It, it, it <laughs> yes, just doesn't exactly. exist. And then and Hillary Clinton isn't going to ever be put in that situation, whereas Donald Trump will be on trial in New York City, in Washington, D.C. And so th that is a part of the asymmetry also is that the entire like ruling base of the establishment is on one side exactly of this war. you know people say like oh the red pill is that people who have information that will lead to the arrest of hillary clinton die actually the red pill is no amount of information will ever lead to the arrest <laughs> of hillary clinton there is nothing you could show anybody yeah, that that's, would that's ever just result a in a woman a day in court yeah, yeah that's a big cope that you think at the end of this tr you know whatever the QAnon crazy is that oh no he's Trump's in charge the whole time and, hold yeah. on, hold jack on. kennedy is coming back now hold to on arrest. roseanne has a standing bet with michael malice two of them one is that there will not be an election so we're looking forward to that and that there will be military tribunals by the end of the year which i i don't know if, she, if you're talking about this year or what but uh you know we'll see she is but, right uh, about everything let's but but you know what? to be honest she made a good point though because i asked her to clarify on this i said are you saying we all just skip election day the tv says no elections or are you saying that something changes the election fundamentally to the point where it's a sham like north korea's elections mm -hmm. well and if that's I, the case we didn't have an election I, in 2020 well, let me say this. Or 2016. Uh, look, I'll say, as, uh, and I say this uh, the disclaimer, I love Roseanne. I consider her like a comedy icon. And every time I've met her, I'm giddy in the room that I'm even in her presence. And she's just mm -hmm. hilarious and so great. But perhaps a little bit more of a serious voice on this uh, topic is Colonel Douglas McGregor, yep. who also said he is, I don't know exactly exactly what he said but he basically said that he is very concerned that there will not be a democratic election in 2024 now i'd like to hope he's he's wrong about that um he, but, he wasn't wait, 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 wrong wait, wait, wait. about, we talk about, about russia wait, wait, winning can we, can we break down what does that mean does that yeah, mean yeah and this is the important question we had with roseanne does that mean there's no polling stations the tv just says you're not voting or does it mean it's going to be uh, donald trump removed from the ballot and then 75 million people feel like they're not allowed to vote at all because of this. Well, I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. It's not my prediction. But I think what, uh, if I remember correctly, this was on Patrick Bet David's show. He said this, uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor, that is, who's been right about a lot of stuff over the last 20 years. And um, I think he was basically saying that some type of emergency is going to be declared 
uh, and that that is going to that it's going to be used as an excuse to like postpone well, he, indefinitely he's... the next election. Now, again, I'm not claiming this is going to happen, mm-hmm. but I will say that it, if that sounds crazy to you, just take a step back, look at the last three and a half yep. years in America, and go look. A lot of things sound crazy. The idea of lockdowns would have sounded really crazy in 2019. Well, even and, you know. That happened. If you talk to yourself from 2014, you were like, all right, so here's what's going to happen. Donald Trump's going to be elected president. And then the deep state's going to try to unseat Donald Trump when he's the president of the United States because he's trying to dismantle the industrial military complex and get us out of all of these foreign wars. And then what's going to happen is there's going to be a virus that was created through research funded by the United States that'll be released and everyone's going to be locked in their homes and the economy's going to crash and we're going to have rampant inflation. And then people are going to be debating whether the election was still. You'd be like, what are you talking about? But also the FBI and the CIA will be working against Donald Trump the entire time they'll be lying to him about troop counts in yeah. syria yep. yeah. we'll have a right. bunch of different fronts for nuclear uh, for world war three yeah it's let this me, is all going to happen in the next five years let me you pull this up so let me pull this yeah. up we have this from zero hedge i don't think we'll ever get to the 2024 election colonel douglas mcgregor retired warns uh, uh and that's this is the gist of it uh so let's see i, I think oh i think that's, does that's he it. usually make uh, bombastic right, claims he's like on this? he's on the pbd but, podcast no 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 this is not he is not like uh he's not the type of guy to just say wild things to get a reaction this is a serious guy this was like a highly decorated colonel in the military he was mcmaster's boss let me at let, one point in the military and then just like he kind of turned against all of the wars i believe he drew me, up me, the me, plans me. for battle with russia if we were to ever go to war with them. let me he's let me read this guy. uh so sure, sure. they want to they, they first in the zero Hedge article break down who he is they say uh bet david laid out how he thinks 2024 will play out he says newsom will go around defending biden selling biden's record have him constantly attack desantis if biden doesn't step down have mainstream media attack him once jill notices the NSA attacks have a private meeting with biden sharing strategy to save face multiple documentaries showing him as a modern fdr massive simon and schuster book deal defend his legacy step five choose one of the few options to step down due to health jill and i prayed about it we've we've we fixed everything trump broke we're out Step six is in order to prevent Kamala from backstabbing, let her become the first female president for a split second, then step down, divide his hands in Trump. Newsom becomes 47 to step eight, yada, yada. In response to this, McGregor went dark, beginning by noting that, first of all, I think it's brilliant. And I think that if we are li- we're living in a linear world, in other words, when one event follows the next logically, you're absolutely right. But uh, but I don't think we'll ever get to the 2024 election. I think things are going to implode in Washington before then. From there, it gets more ominous. Now, uh, I don't I don't know that I disagree. And uh, one of the reasons is, which we'll get into it a little bit later, is is TikTok pushing the Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden letter to America and having a bunch of Gen Z leftists claim that Osama was yeah. correct. Again, we'll talk about that in a moment. But I'm just saying the, the political divide in this country is so psychotic right now yeah. to the point where, like we already mentioned, if you're being criminally charged, in a liberal district, your best bet is to say Trump made you do it. No matter what it is, shoplifting. I was watching this video about Donald Trump and he told me to do it. Please help, help. I'm a victim of, of the guy well, you hate. I, listen, dude, I'll say still to this day, and you, Tim, you've done some incredible things in, in your career. But if I had to pick still to this day, what I'd say I think your greatest moment was, was still Jack Dorsey rogan (laughs) with the rogan because it was just such an incredible thing it everything lined up where like first if you remember uh that jack dorsey went on rogan and they didn't have a very confrontational argument and it's literally to this day the only joe rogan experience episode where i ever saw like joe's audience really upset with him and and as great and this is a credit to joe you know full disclosure is a friend of mine but a credit to him is he was like okay i hear you let's like run that back with someone who's critical well, of them. Not, but you had the point to them and people could accuse you of being hyperbolic people could accuse me of kind of the same thing um but you had that moment to them where you were like uh, and i don't remember your exact words but you were like you guys don't realize what you're playing with here like you don't realize the game you're playing and you're like i'm getting a van and like going to be bringing my, and like i'm laugh. like really concerned about like you provoking a civil war in this country and Okay, it's not like we've had a civil war exactly since then, but look, we are, we know we're all flirting with it. And this is a real thing that when people make these kind of dire warnings, I understand it's easy to go, oh, that's kind of crazy. But look around at this country, man. We are flirting with a lot of very insane possibilities. Time travel test. Go back to, what was it? Was it 2018 or 2019? Uh, when I was on with with Jack Dorsey, Vijay, and, yeah. and Rogan, it might have been 2019. It was 2018. Yeah, it was 2018. It was 19. It, it might have was been. it 19? Yeah. yeah. Go back to that year and tell people, if, if I went back and I, I, everything I said was was vague predictive, like 
this country is headed towards civil war. I'm going to get a van. I'm, I'm building a van with solar power, getting ready to <laughs> bug the F out. And they're laughing like, haha, yeah, 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 right. Now go back and say, since then, the, for the first time ever, a sitting president has been indicted in multiple jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. January 6th, just January 6th alone. I had uh, uh, Ryan Long came here on the show. Love Ryan Long. He's and hilarious. he's fantastic. I was just thinking yeah, about it. One, one of the first things he says when the show goes live is he goes, Tim, you told me there was going to be a civil war. What happened? I thought you, you, you were getting me all hyped up. I was really worried when I left. And then I said, a thousand Trump supporters stormed into the Capitol and disrupted the Electoral College vote count. And he went, oh. Well, and I mean, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm and, saying, and even the, the riots of 2020. I mean, right. the fact that we had the longest sustained riots causing billions of dollars of property destruction that same year. So this is or the, the so this is the, this is the important thing to understand is, um, you know, going back to something like that debate, what we're seeing with Twitter, we're seeing uh, uh, the the hyper polarization of the of, of Twitter, the rules they were creating, the narratives they were swinging and the bifurcation in American culture. And that's the point I was making. Like, you guys keep doing this. Yeah, you are creating two distinct universes. And what I could see at the time and what I can see now is like a blur. It's like when you're, if anybody wears glasses, you know exactly what I mean. Your glasses are off and you see a, a strange shape in front of you and you can't exactly define it, but you're like, there is a person walking towards me right now. You put your glasses on, you can see it clearly. If I had glasses, I could see the future. But I'm saying what we're witnessing right now, I, as Phil Labonte says, what's the off ramp? If, if we are now seeing in these, in these, in these January 6th cases, confess and say, Donald Trump made you do it or you're done. We're seeing Enrique Tarrio getting 20 years. He wasn't even there. But more importantly, since that point, we've had the summer of love riots, the worst riots in 50 years, 30 plus deaths. We've had a guy gunned down in the street in Portland. We've had multiple autonomous zones. I can't even begin to stress how we've normalized this. Go back then and say, it, what if I said to Jack Dorsey and Vijay Gotti very specifically, within the next year or a year and a half, there will be far left extremists who occupy city centers with rifles and kill people who oppose hmm. them, they'd say, you're nuts. Right. And it happened. And now we're just like, oh, that happened. Are we not even shocked so, that it's going on? Yeah, yeah. So, so exactly. And so the, okay, the point that I'm trying to make here is that, it, okay, like imagine, I don't know what the analogy exactly would be, but so imagine um, you go, uh, you know, you were in a business and you were talking to the other like stockholders and you go, I think this business in, is in real trouble. I think we're going to be out of business next year. And then next year, you're not out of business, but your stock is down 90%. And they went, see, you're wrong. We weren't out of business. Fire and we're doing and great. Like, okay, fine. So I'm not saying, yeah, technically speaking, maybe you weren't out of, maybe it wasn't a civil war. Maybe we weren't out of business, but still at least grant that there was like a lot accurate to this prediction but, but, but and that's on. my point about by the way just tying this back to the not being elections maybe that's not exactly right maybe colonel douglas mcgregor is not word for word right about this but there still might be but much like with your prediction like some real insight i'll into give you that. one i'll give you i'll give you the poten the potentiality october 2024 a single state secretary of state decides donald trump is ineligible based on the 14th amendment as they've interpreted it and so they remove his name from the ballots immediately. And we're when we're three weeks out or whatever from the election. So early voting's happening. Immediately, you get the Trump team, all the conservatives, everyone filing emergency notices saying we need an injunction on this immediately. And then the state says, OK, we'll see you in court. They go to court. By December, there's a ruling. Yeah, guys, you can't keep Trump off the ballot. Oh, the election's over. Trump wasn't on the ballot. We've already seen in Michigan and Minnesota, they've said no to this. But the issue would be there. Look, we saw this in Arizona. And so I'm not basing this off of nothing. In Arizona, the wrong ballots were printed on the wrong paper. So the machines didn't work. I guarantee you. I shouldn't say that because I can't actually guarantee you. But I would tell you this right now. I will. I would bet a substantial amount of money that in 2024, we will see similar voting machine errors yeah. on par with a misprint that results in jurisdictions failing. It may. Listen, if. We hear about 100 jurisdictions, and it totals maybe a single percentage point that this happened. No one will accept it, no matter which side it ends up being. Left, if it happens to Trump, if it happens to anybody else, I knew some. I don't yeah, think it's look, uh, Well, the, the truth is that government is a faith-based system, and that's that's especially true for democracy. The whole thing is kind of reliant on this. It's all a religion. 
in a way. Well, like it's, it's all like you believe in it. We believe in look, government is a religion in in every sense of the word, right? You it has it's kind of like um sacraments and its rituals and its nobilities it's and it's sacred, got, cows. It's, it's sacred yeah. cows it has its blasphemy the things you're not allowed to say it, it, right it has all of this and also you know much like religion um and i i say this as someone who believes in god so don't take this the wrong way but it is so picture this like the religion you don't believe in not the religion you do believe in okay so if you're religious every other religion not your one Based. uh but also <laughs> it doesn't exist like government itself doesn't exist. It's an idea that's in your head. And that um, idea and that's, is almost gone. You, well, right. But it's, that's the point is that if it's not in your head, then it's not, you know, there's no, there isn't government. There's buildings and there's men with guns and the, who will enforce the politicians wills. And there's titles that we made up, you know, Senator, governor, president, <laughs> but none of that is objective reality. Right. Right. This is an idea that we all buy into. And, if and so when you have something like 330 million people in a nation, and then however, what is it? Uh, 140 million voters or something like in that ballpark. And then we're all recording all of their votes one day. Yeah, now, obviously, it could be a much better system than we have here. But it requires, to some degree, a leap of faith for people to just say, I believe in this system. And nobody has that in the United States. Or and very few I, people I, I have think, that. Losing our religion. I, I, I yes. think it's fair to say that 2012 was the last election. I'm not saying 100%. It is true. I'm saying it's fair to say in that 2016 was disputed by the left as fraudulent because Russia interfered. They even believe they flipped votes. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. 2020, the Trump supporters said the same thing of the Democrats. I don't care who you think is right or wrong. You're allowed to think you're right. You're allowed to think other people are wrong. The point is, we have now had two elections where both sides have accused each other of very dramatic, serious yes. treason. And, 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 yes, and the point is that, that it's almost like if you believe it, then you're right. Because the point I'm making about saying it's like a religion, and again, I, I really, just to be clear, I'm not trying to knock the idea of religion. I'm saying like, some of the things that I think are the most beautiful ideas and institutions in the world. I think marriage is amongst the most beautiful institutions in the world. But in a marriage, if either the husband or the wife doesn't believe in it anymore, then they're right. Right. There, oh, there is no there is no objective thing there. It's like if you don't believe it, it like then you you're right. Then you're not in this anymore. It almost requires both oh. of you to believe in this thing <laughs> that it's real. It's, okay, it's a in much a second, bigger debate, can, but I do disagree. You, 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 you can get into you none of that. No, no, no. You, you can get into how you trap your wife in the basement after this. But <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, I'm saying my wife is free to leave anytime she wants to, and she doesn't want to leave. Uh, no, now, it's it's not I'm about one. She's Catholic, that, though, right? So. Well, but you're not baptized. Yeah. Well, it's, it's yeah. a different situation. But my point well, is, that, okay. don't you, so, but you don't believe in the concept of like sacramental marriage or that you're like actually bound in a way where you can't leave. Whatever. I'm not saying that you're not. I'm saying you can believe that you're bound in, in that way. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that. I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe that I've made a commitment to my wife that I said in front of our families and in front of God and mm -hmm. that I will I, till death do us part. Uh, and, and yes, I believe that. But if I stop believing that it doesn't exist anymore, that's my point. It's, it requires the belief in that, otherwise it's over. And so in a sense, even though it is completely ridiculous for the the left half of America to say that Vladimir Putin overthrew the government in 2016 mm -hmm. when he installed Trump, them believing that in itself changes the whole dynamics of politics. I and the same thing for Trump supporters who believe the election was stolen in 2020. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't or it was. I'm just saying once you believe that, we're not playing the same mm -hmm. game anymore. Well, that, you know, you no, 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 I agree with you're, some of that. But you're putting on a, like the lens of what you think is right and wrong. I'm saying forget what you think is right or wrong. I'm saying if your wife stops believing that she has she is to, going to, to act to, as if she's then, not married then you're to in a different game that. you're in a different game it's now a certainly different and situation and so that's what we're but, dealing with in america today yeah no my point is simply to say that I, I agree with some of what you're saying and i think ultimately we would just disagree on like the moral questions of how you're sort of formulating the analogy the way i understand it is i believe obviously in the the trueness of my faith i also believe there are such things as false religions i think anytime you have a false idol you have a false religion and government has become an idol for many people especially people in government they really do see themselves as the highest moral authority even fauci saying something like i am the science i mean that is a mockery of christ <laughs> i am the way i am the truth i am the life fauci is saying he is truth itself and they also say that science is the way and the life they have this insane kind of scientist system of thought built up where anyone who calls themselves an expert Right. is now entitled to tell you exactly how how to live your life they have the fullness of the truth so i, I totally agree but, that there are parallels here with with um 
false religions. Ro- Rothbard actually talked about this in Anatomy of the State that once faith in the state declines, they would replace it with a technocracy or scientism. It's exactly what we've seen. We yeah. that they're basically evolving naturally. But I, I want to point. Uh, I want to go back to a point from a minute ago when you were talking about uh, you know sitting down with Jack Dorsey on on Rogan. The whole reason that, oh, first off, you didn't know at the time, but because, thanks to Elon Musk's acquisition and the Twitter leaks, right. we now know that much of those policies in the terms of service modification as well as the moderation policy shifts were being dictated by a multitude of three-letter agencies. Oh. Now, let's back up yeah. a little bit further. The whole reason that that they felt genuinely righteous in in modifying these things, even if you discount the FBI interference and everything else, was because they felt genuinely that Donald Trump had had the election stolen because of Russian interference. Yep. That was also mm-hmm. the state that had planted those seeds. All fictitious. Hillary Clinton, the Steele dossier, all a lie. So you have this entire censorship apparatus that is being rolled out and you have useful idiots that are actually propagating it based off of deception that is all a CIA plan no, no, from no. the get-go. Now, now let's just to, to, to add to what you said, they are. They genuinely believe Trump stole the election. He's a he's a Putin asset, so he must be stopped. Mm-hmm. But that narrative itself was created by them, and this is why I have long described Twitter as Jack Dorsey hooking his own sewer system into his own mouth. <laughs> Dorsey created Twitter with a team, and everybody's sharing ideas. Crackpot, psychotic refuse is splattered all over the place on Twitter, and Jack Dorsey decides I'm going to take that funnel and shove it down my throat and starts consuming it. He then adopts the ideology of Mm -hmm. chaos. Mm -hmm. Listen, this is the important thing. The the, uh, TikTok story uh, uh, about Gen Z believing bin Laden was correct because they read his letter proves my point. There's no way they actually read his letter. If they did, it's all anti-LGBT. They didn't actually read it. They're simply saying they agree with it because they're seeing other people say it. Jack Dorsey saw the same trends decided to abide by them without knowing what he was talking about. And that's what the left is. And he built rules around it, which helped propagate the very cult. All right. Before we get into the the Osama bin Laden letter, if I just one thing on on that, like, and I don't completely disagree with you, but there is kind of like another element into this, which is that, look, if you look at the state of social media from uh, pre-2016, it was just a different world. And I'm not saying that nobody ever got like banned or kicked off. There were very rare instances where people would go really, really far, like where people would actually be like advocating like, you know, Nazism and stuff like that where they would get banned. But it was very rare. I mean, I remember back in the days of the wild, wild west, and I say that in the best possible sense of the term as a libertarian, love the wild, wild west. Me too. Uh, But that it was a, you could kind of say whatever you wanted to without any fear that like, oh, I better watch myself or I bet I'm good. And of course it was because all of the incentives lined up for social media companies to not want to kick people no, off no, no, because I, there I, was real competition still. Well, no, look, the so, whole so, thing is they want you to be on their site. Exactly. They don't want to kick you and off. Now, of now their they site. don't. I, but, now, but so, so let me give you the the quick br- finish your thoughts so I can. Well, so but my point is that the rise of Donald Trump who really tweeted his way to the presidency and tweeted his way to the presidency when the entire establishment said this guy is not allowed to win and ended up winning and used Twitter to drive the entire news cycle through the entire mm-hmm. uh, 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 election. When, once he won, the the all of the powerful people in government and the media class, they couldn't simply accept that, oh, he had a message that resonated with the people, even though we told you there was no way this message would resonate with the people. And we couldn't accept that Hillary Clinton turns out to just be a horrifically corrupt, unlikable, awful human being. And but this was, I'm just saying this actually happened, that they hauled all of the heads of uh, the big mm-hmm. social media, the big tech companies in front of Congress and explicitly in front of everybody threatened them with violence. You know, they threatened them with, we will regulate your company. The reason Trump won is because of disinformation and Russian interference, and you better do something about that or else. Many and of them that, threatened so nationalization. Saying, that was a, that was me, a factor yeah. so in let, what let me, happened, let me, let me, a major factor. Let me give you the quick rundown um, of what social media started as. Social media website, post what you want to post. People did. Mm-hmm. Eventually, too many people are posting. Facebook says people are, their, their feeds are cluttered up. Reverse chronological isn't working. We need them to stay on the website. Algorithms were, were created. Algorithms will deliver to you content we think you like better. Many of them failed. The early algorithms of YouTube were, if it gets more clicks, show it more. What happened? Every thumbnail became women in bikinis. Now, I, I'm dead serious. Right. 
What ends up happening then is a bunch of companies start emerging. Huffington Post, one of the first. All of a sudden, they're getting massive traffic. Everyone's clicking their articles. They can read the news now, not through a newspaper, and comment on these stories. What ends up happening? Through the algorithms, Facebook says, share the links that get the most clicks. What happens then? What gets the most clicks? Police brutality videos. Things that in, in, uh, make people angry get the most clicks. Overnight, in the early 2010s, we end up seeing, my favorite example is Mike.com. Do you guys know that started as a Ron Paul, pro Ron Paul website? Yeah, you told me about it. Mike.com started as libertarian pro Ron Paul hmm. and with a component of anti-police brutality because libertarians were very into this. Eventually, however, Mike becomes social justice. Why? It was getting more clicks to go beyond police brutality. This whole machine's always been in play. So we can say pre-2016, it was a different story. No, 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 no. You were just, and you were walking into the building. You just didn't see the bowels. Well, no, I'm not. Deep, I'm, deep, deep so, beneath. so I don't, I, I don't deny that. And I think there is part of this that just was an organic force of like, how can we get more clicks and more clicks and more clicks? But I am saying that like there, there was a government intervention. And obviously we know from all of like the Twitter files and all of that stuff now that there was massive like government intervention that certainly put their thumb on this scale and said, and particularly, I'm not just saying about the clickbait stuff. I'm more talking about like the tech censorship stuff where they really did crack down right, on right, these right. companies and insist that you like censor dissenting voices. On. And oftentimes, well, let me just say, and oftentimes mm -hmm. it was dissenting voices who were getting tons of I, clicks. I, and what you need to understand got, is the people working for the Intel agencies are not like it's a 30 year old guy in 20 in 2005 who is now a 40 year old guy in 2015 who went whoa we better censor this it is in 2015 them hiring a new 30 year old who's been indoctrinated for 10 years by the refuse machine a 10 year old sure. a kid born in 2000 gets on the internet gets on facebook for the first time in 2010 and what does he see on facebook literally nothing but police brutality videos the, the pr police brutality was so ubiquitous on Facebook mm. that one of there was a website dedicated to nothing but police brutality videos in the top 500 global websites making millions of dollars. You're 10 years old. You get on Facebook and it's all you see. Yeah. For the next four or five years in your formative years, the only thing you see, guess what? They're BLM activists now. Now you have critical race theorists and Marxists. Now imagine this. Imagine you're already 10 years old in, in 2000 and you're just starting to get on the Internet. By the time you're 15, you're being inundated with this stuff. 10 years later, you're 25. You're now working in these intel agencies. You're, yep. you're out of college. You're interning. This is what we saw with Bud Light. I predicted this. I said, I'm willing to bet it's going to turn out. I, I, I was talking to Vivek about this. It's a young millennial marketing person who has just brought on and has risen, risen in the ranks and is now trying to push their crackpot garbage into the machine. What did it turn out to be? Exactly that. A millennial woman who said, let's do wokeness and then burn the company right. to the ground. Because we don't want these frat boy customers that buy, you know, millions of cans of our why, beer every year. Why are we seeing 16 year olds in San Francisco marching through the hallways, chanting from the river to the sea? Do you genuinely think these kids know anything about Israel, Palestine? No, they've been indoctrinated by their by their let's, schools. Let's let's get let's let's go to it, baby. Well, it's not just their well, schools. Hold on, we got it. We got it. Let's jump point about that. After we jump to the next story, well, but I got a point yeah, about, we, point we, about. We can make another point. Well, I just want to say you mentioned they're brainwashed by their schools. That's that's certainly true in part. Um, I, I had the privilege of speaking to Dr. George Barn on my podcast, and he's done research on what tends to form the beliefs of the youth in America. And what he found is that, like, without a close second, media is basically what shapes their opinions. When you look at schools, you look at parents, yeah. you look at churches. It's not. It's, it's, it's far, far above all of those things. Is media what they're consuming on television, basically, and, and or and, on social and media? We, and we and so. It. So here, let, let me let me pull this story from the Daily Mail. We got a lot of stuff to uh, point points to make. TikTok will scrub videos of anti-Israel Gen Zers fawning over Bin Laden's vile 2002 letter to America because it clearly violates our rules on supporting any form of terrorism. I want to show you this image. In this image, can you switch over, Serge? It says TikTokers uh, are now justifying, this is from Libs of TikTok, the 9-11 attacks and praising bin Laden because he was just the resistance. This man, in, in one of his videos, it, sh it says, 2011, me finding out we got him and he's cheering. Then it switches to this, reading his letter to America knowing he was right. Full stop. The point? TikTok is doing what we have seen social media companies do quite a bit of. They are creating a trend. And these people have not actually read bin Laden's letter, not even a single word of it. And I know for a fact, I think any sane person can see that what they're doing is instead 
oh, this guy got a million views by saying that. Let me make the same video and get a million views. There's yes. there's definitely a lot of that. I don't I, know. I don't, I don't think it's a lot. There's, I don't know there's if no way sure. woke leftists read a letter saying ban homosexuality and then said he was right. So you're telling me that you don't believe in woke leftists' ability to contradict themselves and like no, this, I'm saying the drop of a dime. I'm saying that some of these posts that are prominent come from Muslim activists who are saying, look, he was right. And they, I, do you see the video where uh, it was it was Billboard Chris and the Antifa guy goes up to two Muslim women and says, he's trying to stop kids from being trans. And they're, <laughs> yeah. and they're like, we agree. What happens then is because people are getting millions of views, but, these other young people are like, I want to get millions of views and just make a, a fake video claiming they read the letter when I, they not, did not. I'm not denying that. There, I'm sure there are people who are doing that. Bro, I'm, but I'm, I'm just, no, 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 but I'm no, just no, making dude, the point that- they can, they can contradict themselves, but I will not- No, but I mean in the most blatant way. And I get like that. They can, no, they can contradict not. themselves. No, I mean, I've, I've seen it over and they're, over they're, again. They're where not, the woke leftists can literally sit here and say, like, um, they go, there's no such thing as gender. And also, I knew I was in the wrong gender from the moment listen, I was listen. born because it's in we, my brain. And we like, had, These are the completely yes, contradictory ideas. We had Lance from the Surfs on the show who said, you can get abortion whenever you want. Then he said, but, but a woman can't do meth because it intentionally kills the baby. Right? We, <laughs> yeah, we've seen right. these things and yeah. everybody loved that clip. But I do not believe you can take a statement, ban homosexuality, put it in front of any leftist and say, would you agree with this? I think if I, say they would not agree with. Well, me. look, I, the, the 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 issue here always is and I've I've been struggling with this myself over the last, uh, say, month or whatever, is that I think when there is uh, when there is a reasonable point to be made and then it's put into the hands of left wingers to make that reasonable point, they will make it in the worst way possible. Um, so I think that what's going on, obviously this has to do with the context of what's happening with Israel and, and Gaza right now, right? Like and, that's, and, the, that's and, the, a part of the listen, reason listen. why this is going so bad. 16 year olds chanting from the river to the sea is why they're saying bin Laden was right. They don't know anything about what they're talking I come, about. Listen, I'm not defending left-wing 16 year olds. They're going to say a lot of stupid things. But this is the point. I think that, but I think what the, what, what the point should be. So I'm, I'm with you completely. Left-wing 16-year-olds are stupid. That's not, the, that's the, my, my point is, it is not just 16-year-olds. We have 37-year-old millennials who are indoctrinated in the exact same way. Yeah, they're also who have stupid. No they're also yes, 16. Yes, no, sure, sure, <laughs> but listen, these are people in the intelligence agencies. How old is Vindman? These are people who are at the CIA who are removing Donald Trump from the presidency because they believe this crackpot BS. I, I mean, I think, sure, I, think sure the people, I think the people in the intelligence agencies, even the ones who are removing uh, or trying to remove Donald Trump, are much more on board with Israel than Bingo. against Israel. Uh, but I would say this. Look, I think the kernel of truth here and what a lot of these guys just are trying to get at but do a horrible job of, of getting at it is that, look. In Bin Laden's letter to America, obviously he's an Islamist and he's saying all types of crazy things that a lot of us don't agree with. Well, Seamus maybe mostly, <laughs> but the rest of us don't agree with that. Uh, but there are stated grievances in this letter Let that you have to admit, okay, he probably has a legit grievance here. You understand why this would be why this would be fertile ground for recruitment and why almost any people would probably resent this if this but was let happening. Me let me them. read the first one. As for the first question, why are we fighting and opposing you? The answer is very simple. Number one, with a bullet, because you attacked us and continue to attack us. That's the first thing he says. So like, uh, no, no, look, no, 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 full stop, full stop. I, I am, I, I'm sorry, dude. I, I, I reject this outright. You can't just read a sentence. I can without, read, I read the whole thing, Tim. I know exactly and, and what he so says. And so you need to understand what attack us means. And he outlines very clearly in the entire second half, attacking us means stopping Sharia Islam from taking over the well, world. Yes, he yes. also includes 1.5 million kids that, that starved so in this, Iraq because of the sanction point, regime. And my you can't point discount is this. that either. My point is... It's like a guy saying, I, I, am, I am attacking you because you kicked my dog. And we're like, wow, you kicked his dog. Why? And he goes, because I was trying to, to eat it. And you're like, well, wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> this, so what's happening is you got a lot of these leftists and Glenn Greenwald did this too. Bin Laden was mad about U.S. foreign policy. Bin Laden was mad about U.S. foreign policy Im, Im, imposing it, 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 a Western viewpoint and well, preventing well, Islam. Look, it's all but Tim, in his letter. Uh, well, look, okay, again, there's no question. He's a radical Islamist. And that's all That's that's uh, all throughout the letter. You can see that there. But I think that the issue is that... So so these left wingers take it in this direction that's like, 
well, he was right. And you're like, no, of course that's not the conclusion. The conclusion is he was an insane madman who's obviously like an, he's obviously an evil figure. There's no getting around that. The point is that obviously within this Islamist rhetoric, there are also these grievances of, and look, that you have attacked us, that you have bases in our holy land, that you, uh, you prop up brutal dictators in our region, that you support the Israelis who are, are, are have ethnically clen- uh, cleansed the Palestinians, that you, uh, and then the, of course the sanctions campaign against uh, the Iraq and all the kids who died. Now, I'm not saying obviously let me read, let his me wishes. His wishes are that they would be under Sharia law and and, and Muslim control. But it's still here's the thing, right? When it, since uh, from 9/11 and the years these have slowed down a little bit, but for at least 15 years afterward, the FBI did all of these, um, you know, sting operations. What they what are really entrapment operations where they claim we foiled another terrorist plot, but then you find out yep. that they created the whole thing. Yep. Every time they did it, every time they did it, go look at how they recruited the person. Right, listen, they listen. never read them the Quran. They always said, how do you feel about U.S. foreign policy in the Muslim world? The point mm-hmm. shouldn't be that Osama bin Laden's a good guy. The point should be that this is why he was able to recruit people sure. who were willing to go and, blow themselves up and, and sacrifice and, and let me, themselves. And let me point this out. When Glenn Greenwald, let me pull up Glenn Greenwald's tweet, says... His three main grievances are U.S. sanctions on Iraq that killed the hundreds of thousands of Iraqi children Two, U.S. support for Israeli violence and three U.S. troops on sacred Saudi land. That is this is what pisses me off. That is I'll tell you what that is. That's Black Lives Matter. That is Michael Brown. That is BLM saying they shot and killed Michael Brown. That's why we're mad. That's why we're rioting. And then you go, well, hold on there a minute. Michael Brown robbed a liquor store and then attacked a cop. Right. Okay, so if, if you're really saying you're mad that he was shot, what you're actually saying is your intention is to be able to freely and willfully rob and, and attack cops. And guess what? It's actually happening now. So you're saying it's lying through omission. Uh, well, He's not I'm, including the full context of the letter. When we get when we get people like Glenn Greenwald coming out and saying, well, look, bin Laden said they were mad about U.S. war. He was mad about foreign policy. No, 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 no. BLM comes out and says police are attacking us. So we want to abolish the police. We're now three years past the summer of love. And what's happening there? They just released two guys in New York who mercilessly beat a cop without bail. We had a woman who was just killed. And I, I think it was in Georgia. I'm not sure where it was because the guy got released without bail. Everything they said, they said, these cops are killing us. So we need to stop this. They weren't actually mad cops were killing them. They were mad that cops were stopping criminals Look, from doing extremist I, things. I, okay, so I, I I just don't I don't think the comparison is perfect. I get your point on the Let BLM me, I, I stuff of that. But okay, sure. Go so y- you read the first line, you attack us. Want me to read you the first line of what he defines? I want to read the whole as? thing. You got I'm not gonna read the whole thing on the show because yeah, it's long. Okay. <laughs> but he says uh, in the first section, under your supervision, consent and orders, the governments of our countries, which act as your agents, attack us on a daily basis. One, these governments prevent our people from establishing Islamic Sharia using violence and lies to do so. OK, two, they humiliate us. Three. So when you ask him, what does it mean to be attacked on a daily basis? He is not saying, I can't believe that you're shooting at us. He's saying we want Sharia. He goes on to say the whole second half. Number two, Tim, Tim, what he's clarifying there is that you're you're toppling the leadership that they want you're basically you're in they they're asking for autonomy i, I disagree with them i get it but, but if they want autonomy they want if they want sovereignty then they can have it so my point is this these leftists it all comes down to have not actually read the letter do not actually understand what his, his I, goals I agree were. with you that they didn't read it yeah, but so it doesn't change say, the fact that he has some all, legitimate yeah. grievances well let's say they're all wrong right and obviously any leftist who's going to say realizing osama bin laden was right about everything is like beyond stupid and just it it's insane obviously forget any of that if your conclusion from any of that is that therefore it's okay to slaughter innocent people yeah. then F you, you're a horrible person and you're a madman. But I think the point is what should like, like not the leftist interpretation of this, but say like the, the Ron Paul interpretation of this, which I think he was completely right about and the Pat Buchanan, like I'm talking about the most right wing and the most libertarian, not left wingers at all. And the point that they would make is that it's like, look, there's the, the Pat Buchanan quote that I love, which I think nails it always right is he says, terrorism is the price of empire. And if you don't wish to pay the cost, you must abandon the empire. So I think what you're dealing with here is that, listen, these are a group of people 
who have a different way of life than us and a different belief system than us. And I'm not defending that way of life or that belief system. But when you go over there and you impose your own brutal dictators on them, you slaughter their no innocent civilians. And you, so, but I'm saying, but so that's what I think should be gained from and, this and, letter and, and bit, and uh, my, by Bin Laden. My, and is my issue is this. Those parts are legitimate grievances. And my issue is no one disagrees, but... Well, when, some do. But you don't, my, my point disagree. is, here in this room, okay, we sure. get it. Yes, U.S. Okay. foreign policy has been a disaster. Yep. Afghanistan is the latest in a long line of disasters. I think it would be unfair to say every single thing ever done was a disaster, but boy, did the U.S. lose a lot of wars in the past 70 years. Lose, 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 lose. But for these leftists to do two things. One, claim bin Laden was right and actually be activists who are pro-Palestine who read it. Well, they're lying and they're manipulating and they're trying to obfuscate what his actual goals were. And sure. two, the other leftists who are claiming they read it and they thought he was right, they did not read it. That's yes, just I, I agree. But I, I, I don't, I don't yeah. disagree with My that. My point yeah. that bothers me is people who are arguing that, like, like Glenn Greenwald's tweet is irksome. That is not Bin Laden's grievance. They are, they are, they are, they are single facts of things that he's using examples of, of how we stopped him from having Sharia. And let me, let me read section sure, three. Sure. I read you section one, section three. You are a nation that permits the production, trading and usage of intoxicants. You permit drugs and only forbid the trade of them, even though your nation is the largest consumer of them. He says, uh, where, where's the one? You are a nation that permits acts of immorality and you consider them to be pillars of personal freedom. You've continued to sink down the abyss from level to level, et cetera, et cetera. He goes on to say, uh, if, if I go uh, into the earlier sections, you allow fornication, homosexuality, gambling, and usury. Yeah. So when he's, no alcohol, when he's, when he's mad about U.S. foreign policy, that's like. It's starting to sound like Kanye. <laughs> When when Sorry. Sorry. Honest, when yeah. he's mad about U.S. foreign policy, it's not for the reason the anti-war Americans are. And, I don't I don't and, agree with that, Tim. If you've read the whole thing as I have, yes, you're right. He makes a whole bunch of points that I I disagree with, but he also makes a ton of points that are totally legit. He says you have aggressed upon my people for decades after decades. He talks about how how Israel was foisted upon the Arab world and that they they opposed the UN declaration that made it come to pass. I, I get it. I mean, like, he, like, yes, but my he, point, he has a bunch of shit that I disagree with, but then he's got his... Yeah, he's a murderous, he's a murderous the, psychopath. Yeah. Person. But and he's my, also my point breaking, is, he's also raising some grievances, you know? What, what he's saying, like, I, I compare this to BLM, okay? the U, I, I don't think the U.S. should be going to foreign countries and doing these things, but the argument is, is from the left is essentially... Let us do horrifying things to people, slave trade, uh, uh, child marriage, all these awful things. That's what he's saying. Right. So he how should, dare you stop us from so doing he's, the So he's right. wrong. And and the, the he's a bad guy. I mean, that, should, really be, bad that, guy. that should be the conclusion of all this. But I <laughs> will say this. My point point comes down to leftists on TikTok claiming he was right when his message is he wants Sharia law. So, OK, so the leftists are wrong for claiming that he's wrong for wanting Sharia law. But. I just think, look, let, so let's, again, those people are wrong, but let's just talk about what's right for a minute. And now I'll say this, this, this is a point that I tried to make uh, in, in the debate I did last night with Laura Loomer for Zero Hedge, but she was basically just like condemning Islam the whole time and talking about, and I was trying to ju just have this moment of being like, well, look, let's just try to be really fair here, okay? So let's try to think this through, and I'm not, obviously, Bin Laden's a bad guy, but think about what we did after 9-11 how crazy we went as a country. Like in terms of how what we would support, what our government did, what the response to it was, that we look back at this now and we go, wait, so we got essentially missiled, bombed with two planes in, in, in the World Trade Center and we, we created the Department of Homeland Security and the Patriot Act and the TSA and the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq, which we almost all universally look back on and go, whoa, that was wrong. John McCain in his memoir wrote that the war in Iraq was a mistake. So oh, almost everybody like acknowledges like we went a little bit crazy after 9-11 and did a whole bunch of bad things. A lot of innocent people died over that. Now try to imagine, and, and I want you to really try to imagine this, that 1,000 9-11s happened to us and what that would look like how crazy we would go 
That's the reality in the Muslim world. Now, I'm not saying this justifies any of this, and if your takeaway of this is that Osama bin Laden is a good guy, you might be an idiot 16-year-old <laughs> leftist. Yeah. But I'm just saying that before we sit here and condemn them for how off they, and I think this is the point that Glenn Greenwald is trying to get at here, is that it's like, look, when what he's talking about in this letter is describing a thousand 9-11s. And if you actually do the numbers in terms of dead, it's probably more than that. But whatever, just imagining that. And so if we're going to sit here and our reaction to that is going to be like, but you're a radical Islamist and all of this is crazy that you want Sharia law. Okay, fine and fine. But seeing as what our reaction was just after one 9-11, I don't know that after, you know, after a thousand 9-11s, Seamus gets in control. Yeah. What do you and, think and, he's going to want? Sure. Let me, let me, let me, be some let radical let me, Christianity. Let me, let me, let me tell you, based on this letter, based on, based on the letter, what should these leftists do to remedy what they've done? And they, do you know what the answer is? Become straight, uh, uh, convert to Islam. Convert to Islam explicitly yeah. says, as a second question, what are we calling you to do? Calling you to Islam, the religion of unification of God. Bin Laden attacked us for two reasons, he says, because you opposed, you, you've obstructed our, our, the life that we want, the rules that we want. He says specifically, your attacks on us include fornication, gambling, usury, etc. And what do we want you to do now? Join Islam. Okay, but, 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 hold, but, hold on, Dave. Well, can, can, can very ban quick, fornication, can I just ask? usury, but not alcohol. That's what I'm saying. All right. Okay. We might meet in the middle there. <laughs> uh, but do you think, let me ask you this, Tim. Do you think, and I mean this in a real human terms, like trying to put yourself in the, in the position of, of these people. Do you think Osama bin Laden was able to recruit people to be willing to suicide bomb themselves to death because, like, do you think a pretty major factor of that was that maybe they had seen someone who they loved, well, you know start, what I mean, get the first killed? Jihad. The, the first jihad? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Well, I, 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 I kind of think if... You have, I don't know, the first jihad, which is, what was it, went on for a thousand plus years, and they mm -hmm. went from uh, the Middle East all throughout Europe up into Spain. I don't, I, I don't know, was that caused by a thousand 9-11s? Was it like, oh, I think well, the Crusades yeah, but I don't were know. only hold a on, small handful. But I think, I think going that far back in I, history kind of yes, like, offensive. Like, I, have to, I have to make this point, because in the, in the letter itself, he says, 3,000 of your people die, and all hell breaks loose. 1.5 million of our people die. And you won't even you won't even blink an eye. The, the point that he's making, uh, setting aside all of the Islamist bullshit, all of the all of the leftist argumentation, is that we don't treat them as if they're real people. We treat them as if they're lesser, and that's true. Well, and 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 until until we're willing to accept that reality and actually like look in the mirror. If I was born in Gaza in 2006, I would be of fighting age today, and I would have never had any sovereignty whatsoever i'm ruled by hamas i'm ruled by the idf if i go too close to the border i get shot i would be a complete lunatic anytime you bring this up people say oh you're trying to you're trying to justify terrorism you're trying to you know make it sound as if hamas is the good guys i'm not doing that what i'm doing is i'm putting myself in the shoes of people that have been legitimately oppressed and i'm not talking about the let, let, critical let, uh, theory uh, oppression. I'm talking about real effing oppression where okay, your okay. whole life has been dominated. And, 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 I'll, and let me ask you a question. Why were the Marines formed? Uh, the, Barbary the Barbary Wars. Wars. And, and what did, what, what did the Sultan say to Thomas Jefferson, which re requi what resulted in him saying, you know what, fine, then we're forming the Marines. Well, they, the, well the pirates were bribe or uh, demanding uh, uh, ransom. When, when, when the American ships were being attacked by the North African Barbary states, Jefferson and Adams, many other uh, U.S. Uh, agents were like, yo, we got no problem with you guys. Why are you consistently attacking our ships? And you know what the response was? Our religion says we're allowed to do it. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. But so he said, that, well, if that's what, what you're going to do, I am going to raise a Navy and I will wipe you out. And, and it was probably it was but probably a big mistake, that's by the way. That's what the English Empire, Empire that's no, what the British I'm dead, I'm dead Empire serious. I mean, think about the implications of for, first off, he didn't get a declaration of war from Congress. He just went about it on, uh, with having Thomas Jefferson. I think it was Jefferson. Mark, and Repri Mark and Reprisal. That was the, that was the, the point. Well, no, no, no. They got kind of it wasn't even Mark and Reprisal. It was kind of like almost an authorization of military force type deal. By the way, the French and the British had forever just been paying those pirates off yep. paying the ransom and i think he ended up spending a lot more money on it than if he had just paid them off so people died and he wasted a lot of money i'm not saying it's the right thing to do the pirates were the aggressors in that but here's my issue with this my issue with when we go back to like okay but look in the year uh 1801 a radical muslim did this or that here's kind of the problem that 
Look, uh, are you guys familiar with the uh, King Crane Commission? No. Okay, that? so the King Crane Commission was uh, after World War I. Uh, at the end of World War One, I, I think it started at the Paris Peace Conference, and they were trying to get the British and the French on board, but they kind of pulled out of it, so the Americans just did it without them. But they sent a commission into uh, the Muslim world because the Ottoman Empire had collapsed, and now there were all these territories that used to be ruled by the Ottoman Empire, and they were kind of going on like a fact-finding mission. Like, they went there to just kind of like survey and interview a lot of people and figure out what we're going to do with this part of the world. And there's a few really interesting things that they found. Number one, uh, Syria overwhelmingly voted, and Syria uh, back then was much bigger than Syria today, but so it's like the land Syria is, and then I think a bigger area than that. Overwhelmingly, they said, who would you like to, to rule you under a League of Nations mandate? And overwhelmingly, Syria voted for the United States of America. So it, this narrative that they hate us because we're free is really not very true. In fact, when we were viewed as the ones who weren't the imperialist force, remember this is World War I, okay? They, they were like, America, the city on the hill that's all about freedom and doesn't intervene in our part of the world? We love those guys. Like they had nothing but a positive feeling about those guys. And likewise, early on, if you read the early Zionist writers, they were not, like, they didn't consider the Arabs to be an enemy. So, so my, my point is just that actually a lot of, I'm not saying every, the problem with when you go back to, say, like, the 7th century, or you go back hundreds and hundreds of years and go, look, they were being barbaric then. The truth is that everyone was being barbaric then. If we, if we look at more recent and more relevant history, you realize that actually there a lot of this, the Syrians had no problem with America. The is, they hated the British and the French. And the Why is, is that? Social media algorithms are resulting in people sharing things they don't understand. And what, well, I don't, what, I, what I, I, I don't, what I, I agree with you on that. And yes. what I am bothered by is seeing people, I can use this specific example of Glenn Greenwald, instead of pointing out what's going on, misrepresenting the summation of what bin Laden but wrote I don't for think, the justification of their ideology. I don't think he's misrepresenting it. I think oh, he literally is. Well, no, I think he's trying to point out what he views as the most important aspect of that. And I think maybe you're pointing out what you view as the most important aspect of that. I think I'll, I, I'll tell you what I'm I pointing would say out. What I'm I would pointing s- out the, the, the letter has two questions. The first one is 50-50 between the prevention of Sharia law and allowing of homosexuality along with foreign policy from the United States. And the second part is that the U.S. is not Islamic. If I, you're going I, I to claim that. his three grievances are U.S. specific U.S. foreign policy actions, you are misrepresenting what Bin well, Laden. But he also well, no, says that he was. But he, he did mention all of those specific grievances that Glenn Greenwald laid yes. out. So my guess would be, and maybe this is a more charitable interpretation, but I think that what Glenn Greenwald is saying is essentially that like kind of my position on this that well obviously it's a given that osama bin laden's a bad guy and an islamist like no one's real i i mean i guess some crazy 16 year olds are but no normal person is really questioning but that. that's not but the look point at, okay he, let me, look at so, his grievances and now here. let me clarify for you again if bin laden says i attacked you because of these things and glenn says actually it was these things that's misrepresentation but he but does then, mention those fair. things he does say those if things if bin though. laden says there are two main points Okay, the first being the attacks on us, which includes physical and ideological. Okay. And the second half is, is you must become Muslim. And right. then and then Glenn goes, actually, it was only about U.S. foreign policy. Well, he didn't say that. He didn't say it was only about He said three that. points, and he names three specific four. What, right. okay. I'll tell you what bothers me. What bothers me is when activists with po- policy ends lie to gain power. I understand. But it's not, it's not a lie as yes, much as is. you're saying he left out part of it. He mentioned three things and omitted. He explicitly states in his tweet that... His his three main grievances are so he claims those are the main grievances and they're not. There's two main grievances. One is the attack on them and their ideology, both physical and ideological. And the second is that we must convert to Islam. Right. So when people say they hate us for our freedoms, I think it's stupid and oversimplified. You could say, well, look, and you're saying when, this is stupid and over, over when we when we engage in foreign wars, which destroy the way of life of people who don't want to live the way we do, we're making enemies. And what they want is for us to convert to their way of life. Right. If 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 the United States foreign policy acted in ways that resulted in the benefit of Islam, bin Laden would have been happy and he would have wrote that. See, here's the issue, though. Possibly. It, it, up until up until there was decades of interference into the Middle East, they weren't actually trying to get us to convert. It Like, yes, his letter, th- this aspect of his letter, obviously I rejected and I'm not going to become a Muslim to acquiesce to Osama bin Laden's demands. Good call. All, 
Yeah. Well, all, you'll, all, you'll be relieved to know he's dead. Yes. Well, <laughs> thank goodness. Uh, but but all I'm taking away from this letter is is what aligns with with reality, and what does align with reality is that we have bombed his people for decades, and he does categorize that. He says that the sanction regime in Iraq, you guys don't care about this. He says we have tried to be civil. We have you tried know, to rationalize. I, I, with I, you. I pointed that out. I agree. Okay. The point is, but that matters. It's, it's that's important to it's talk. It's broken about. into two sections. You have physically and ideologically attacked us, and you won't convert. Let me read another section for you. This is section 2A of his second half of his letter. We call you to be people of manners, principles, honor, and purity, to reject the immoral acts of fornication, homosexuality, intoxicants, gambling, and trading with interest. To say his main grievances are specifically U.S. foreign policy is wrong. I now, don't... Is he mad about U.S. There was foreign also, policy? There were many Dude, other it, speeches it, this, and many other letters that he is, did where he, he mentioned these grievances over and over. When, so you're right. Again, he's a radical Islamist. And my like, point is this. Like, yeah, like, I don't know. So, why why are people I'm, I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna lay it plainly i am sick of ideologues manipulating information for their personal ideological ends but you're making it sound as if it's not actually listed it he does uh, I, list I, I, no i agree it is listed okay there's two sections the ideological and physical attacks as well as we not converting to right. islam, but the islam but those but are the two main know, grievances. What, I'm taking, what i'm taking from it is what do i have control over i'm not going to become a radical islamist i'm not going to adapt sharia law so, what yeah. i can do is get my effing so, state department to stop and saying now, here's, here's why i just and explain kind of why i, I disagree the, the with the question you. is simply this like, would osama bin laden is are you arguing that he only attacked us because of U.S. foreign policy. Let, yes. Let me say, I think he would not have, I don't think he would have had the capacity to attack us if not for the radicalization that happens because psychopath. of our sanction regime. He was a psychopath. I think the reason he was able to recruit enough people who were willing to, to commit suicide in attacking us was probably blowback. But let me say, this This I think is essentially my disagreement with you. And like, you use the kind of Black Lives Matter, Michael Brown analogy. I'd look at it kind of like if you were, let's say, you were trapping someone in your basement and torturing them every single day. And they are they went crazy and completely lost their mind and wrote some manifesto. And half of the manifesto was like just the rantings of a madman. And half of it was like, and you came down here and you beat me with a wire every single day. And that's why I'm going to try to kill you. And then that guy came and killed you. I'd go. Well, yeah, I mean, look at the manifesto. He came and killed you because you were torturing him every day. Whereas someone else could look at that and go, no, these are the rantings the, of a madman. I, 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 I get it, but that's I don't where think the Glenn analogy Greenwald is one for one. one. No, and, it's and, not and, perfect. And, and it's and not I a perfect Glenn analogy. Greenwald, but the Mike Brown analogy isn't a perfect let, analogy let me, either. I'm my, just my saying that with, that is, I think, what he's Mike trying Brown, to get at. My point with Mike Brown is specifically for the leftists who are adopting this and claiming he's right. When yeah, they, well, they're stupid. Yes. And then when when people like Glenn come out and say, well, bin Laden was mad about war. This fuels... The indoctrination of moronic millennials. And you keep saying 16 year olds, but dude, these are millennials who are in their 30s. No, I know. They're still 16, but I get your point. But, but, but yes, they're but very yes. old 16 and they're, and they're running yes. for office and they're in office and they're and they're chanting these things in the streets. They're in New York celebrating. I, just, Hamas killing I, I people. get your point on that. I'm just saying that also, I mean, Glenn Greenwald has like been serving them a heavy dose of reality through all of this. Fair, fair, so I don't I'm think, you know, criticize him where I think he needs to be uh, criticized. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. But I'm also saying that I don't technically think he said anything wrong. If you want to say he omitted the fact that Osama bin Laden is also a radical Islamist, I I would just be charitable and say, like, I think that's a given for sane Any, people. It's, it's not read, a given for these people that you're pulling up. So fair who, enough. Anyone who read Glenn Greenwald's tweet would have a would have a an incorrect interpretation of the of the summation of the letter. No, I think I, I, I think I if they it. only heard your interpretation, they'd have an incorrect summation too. Yeah, well, I, I, gave you, I, I, I gave you the two full points and 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 gave you the sum, but no, summary. There's, the there's a lot that's included in there. The the sanction regime you didn't mention that was 1.5 million. He says you killed we killed 3,000 of yours. All of a sudden you care. The whole reason that they yes, that, that, the physical attacks on I know, their but, countries but that detail matters a lot because he's saying, he's saying he's saying i have tried to have civil conversation you all don't listen to us you only respond to aggression we're going to give you aggression i'm not justifying and any of this a, Tim. and there is it's a terrible in section one if i'm not mistaken because i i didn't get a chance to read this today when we found it because it's been scrubbed from the internet it's been years since yeah. i've read this and so i'm going off memory yeah. but i did think in section one he did list out those three grievances right like i understand there were the two sections but i think he did list out the three grievances of like there's Military bases in Saudi Arabia. And, 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 hold on. A huge, and, and, a huge part first, of this is the first is grievance is the first Palestine is, is pa the first grievance is Palestine. Uh -huh. So for one. Glenn to say it's Iraq and it's is Israel and then Saudi land when actually the first point was so Palestine. it should be Israel then Iraq uh, so and then it's, Saudi it's, so, Arabia. So it's it's Israel 
It is Israel. It is Israel. It is Israel. Okay. Then it's Somalia. Uh, number five is Somalia. Then it's uh, uh, the next section goes on to be like, you guys uh, use violence to prevent Sharia everywhere. But, but he doesn't talk about a global caliphate. He's not talking. No, I he, know. But but the point you're bringing up with these specific things, I'm not there yet. I'm in section uh, seven. Not there yet. Eight. Not there yet. Nine. Palestine still. Uh, Ten. Uh, still not there still. We want Sharia law and you're blocking Sharia. The next one is, uh, okay, you're stealing our oil. And it's the biggest theft of mankind. Okay, still not those specific military things, but yes, generally foreign policy. Here we go. Finally, I think we're at point 13. You occupy our countries with military bases but, and allow but Jews you're, to you're enjoy skipping, the You're skipping over number one after like paragraph two where he says, because you attacked us and continue to attack us. And then he says, A, you attacked us in Palestine. And then I, he starts to list that. this off. How many times do I got to say the first section is that we attack them? Well, I know, but you're and saying you're like, you're, you didn't say that. You're saying he doesn't do it until the very end. That's no, not no, true. No, no, he no, does no. do it in the very the end. The points very that Glenn Greenwald made have not even come up after the 15th so you're saying paragraph. That, you're saying that uh, the, the Iraq blockade didn't come up until much later. I'm the, saying uh, that for Glenn to make these points, that these are the main grievances, is Glenn choosing subjects that benefit his ideology and it's manipulative. And I, I am sick of ideologues who do this. I don't care if you're the left, right, libertarian, up, down, whatever. I don't care if you're Christian, Muslim, whatever. If you're going to lie to me to steal power, I'm going to call you out for it. Well, I don't think Glenn Greenwald is trying to steal any power. I He's mean, trying I think to impose his ideologically va ideological values by obfuscating what's actually well, being said. He has his own bias. When he reads this, he takes away certain you know notes that he thinks that that's Dude, the summation. On. Yeah, can hey, we say screw, screw Glenn Greenwald and let's talk about the substance of this that, letter for great. a little bit? That'd and my great. point okay, is just using him as a singular example. The left is arguing that bin Laden is right because the first 15 paragraphs are almost entirely about Palestine. Yeah. And, and the context is Israel and Palestine are currently in a the, the hottest conflict we've seen in our lifetimes. Right. And mm -hmm. so they are deciding to claim all of his stuff about Sharia and Islam is also correct well, in its well, entirety. Well, look, I mean, look, again, I think you can say this and I know there's a tendency for people to kind of caricature what uh, characterize what you say. But uh, why is it that this is there's fertile ground for even this type of craziness to take off right now and it is because well look there's this war in gaza going on right now which is pretty horrific and a lot of like innocent people are dying in that war and so even when you have this letter that's talking all about how those people over there hate you in large part because of what your government has propped up israel to be able to do in gaza this is probably at least partially why there's fertile ground for this narrative to catch fire right yeah. now and, and not that, that doesn't mean it's completely right no, it's it's um, actually but, not right. But the, the, here's the problem is that we lied to the American people, not we, but the fucking government did. They didn't tell us the truth about why they were actually upset with us. So now you have all of these kids that are growing up going like, they hate us because we're free. And then they realize, oh, it's actually not just that. It's actually not because it's not true. And it correct. hasn't been true from the beginning. Right. So, so because they were deceived, now they go to TikTok to learn history lessons and then they get misled and we're all upset about it. Well, how about we just start by telling the truth? And my the point street? is social media is indoctrinating young people, the millennials and lower into psychotic beliefs. This kid I pointed up did not just say we were lied to. He says bin Laden was right. That's yes. Okay. Now that's stupid. And that's but what he's they still, are saying. But here's the really sad thing, Tim. Even though you're right and that is insane, they're getting better history than George W. Bush taught them. <laughs> so well, I, I, as, as crazy as all of this is, at least now they're hearing the other side of the story. They're still reaching a very dumb conclusion right. if their conclusion is Osama bin Laden they was right. They did not read the letter. Okay, I, I don't know. There's no way of knowing that look, look, for look. sure. But there's no yeah. there's no reasonable way to say that a leftist agrees with the statement that we must ban homosexuality. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I agree see, with you. No, Most here's of them didn't why. Read it. Here's why I I think you're you're wrong in a sense because the leftists will be so hypocritical that almost every situation they look at, they have to look at it through who is the oppressor versus who is the oppressed. Yes, and yes. whoever is the more white European yes. looking ones is always the more oppressed. And if those two things completely so, contradict each other, it doesn't matter. Yeah, homophobia so like, is okay so, because you're a minority. In general, yeah. if a Muslim is being oppressed, then they'll be like, okay, we're on the side of the Muslim. And then if they feel like a gay person's being oppressed, they're on the side of the gay person. And the fact that that Muslim and that gay person would not get along very and well I, I agree just with does you. not like register and, and i agree mind. with you but it's more mostly about ignorance like when they have queers for palestine and they made the pride palestine flag there's a big difference between not knowing anything and just waving a flag and, also, and like, reading a direct statement that says abandon and ban if, if osama bin laden woke up and was like geez it's 8 30 a.m well osama bin laden was right 
That doesn't mean that he's right about everything he said. Probably some things in here are correct, specifically about why they were attacking. He seems pretty honest, well, the Palestine stuff. But then we got to be clear. He didn't say that they're fighting us because we won't adopt Sharia. Mm. Part of it is you won't let us practice our Sharia in our countries of choice, so we will fight. Then the part of, the second part, what are we calling on you to do now is like adopt Sharia. Right. They're pissed. They're beyond the pale at that point. Yes, because he says... You guys have aggressed so so consistently, and you don't listen to reason. You don't listen to rational discussion. You don't want to have any negotiations. You want to be. You don't want to be civil at all. Think about this. We we phrase these radical jihadis as the most uncivil, barbaric people on the planet. They look at us, the Americans, and they say y'all aren't civil. Think about how crazy that is. The head choppers in Syria think that the American empire isn't civil. People need to internalize this. Actually, think about what they're saying there. That's profound. That's profound that they think that we are the barbarians on earth. T like, take it in for a second. For real. Well, as, you know, this is something that I kind of like came across in the, in the debate I was doing last night. And there's part of this uh, thing where people, look, we are unquestionably, say the United States of America and, and Israel uh, compared to the Muslim world uh, in which we've fought a lot of wars over the last couple decades. We are undeniably much more advanced, much more sophisticated, uh, much more systematized, and they are much more primitive than us. And so it's very easy for people to go like, you know, what people who are on, say, like the pro-Israeli side of the, the argument, if you go, well, look, I mean, Hamas killed all these people. I think that's really wrong, what happened on October 7th. But then, look, Israel's killing all these innocent people in response, and I think that's wrong. It's very easy for them to be like, no, 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 no. That was barbarians targeting civilians, and this is collateral damage done by military strikes. And it's very easy in the Western world to feel this difference that like, well, that no, but that's just different. You know what I mean? This is kind of like, look, this is bad policy. But or they don't, they or don't even feel good, that difference. Or though. even good policy that happens to have these negative, you know, uh, um, results. But if those are your kids, and your sisters and your mothers and your wives who are dying as a result of that policy, it is very easy to say that is every bit as barbaric, that yes. is every bit as evil as whatever, you know what I mean, like could be done in return. Well, it's even yeah. more so brutal because you're coming from a very poor place. Like the people in Gaza are so destitute. You have a full san sanction regime. All they've dealt with is bombardment year after year, sniper fire. These people have been radicalized and we and we refuse to just look in the damn mirror and say, why? Why is this happening? Can we do anything to actually intervene on behalf of these people as opposed to just going, look at what Hamas did. Let's flatten everybody. Let's let's continue the cycle of death and destruction. All I'm calling upon people to do is to actually reflect on what got us here. That doesn't justify anything. It doesn't say that Hamas are the good people. It says, can we stop this cycle of violence? Can we? And, the, and for a lot of people, the answer is no, we can't. I reject that. It, it, please, religious man, well, no, so, back me up so here. I can't speak, <laughs> and this is what I, well, I can't say, it's been hard to get a word in Edward, but I, I can't speak to the, the specific history of the Israel-Palestine conflict because I don't know much about it. But what I will say is you can acknowledge that Islam has a unique problem of violence while also looking at the United States, seeing our own history, recognizing that, for example, in 2001, when New York was attacked, we felt that was an attack on our whole country, and rightly so. I have friends born and raised in Georgia who fought up, who enlisted to fight in a war in the Middle East because people who they'd never met in their entire lives and probably never would were killed in a different state. Same. And so it's reasonable to say that even if I don't agree with their cause for them as people to have their neighbors or family members killed in these conflicts and then have that result in them wanting to take up arms against the West. Well, it's not something I'm saying I uh, agree with Osama bin Laden. It is to say that that's predictable. Yes, exactly. Look, it's predictable. This is what, look, look, all of the wisest people who predicted everything that's gone wrong over the last 30 years in America. I mean, like all of the best people, like the Pat Buchanan's and the Ron Paul's and like all of the guys who stood up and were right about all of this stuff. They always said, like again, to mention that Pat Buchanan quote, that terrorism is the price of empire. Mm -hmm. And if you want, and this is all of it, this isn't an Islamic, like, 
problem. Look at the the Irish when the British were dominating them. He like, literally like, oh, pointed at my alcohol, yeah. by the way, when he's like, "Look at the look Irish! At the Irish. <laughs> look at this guy over look here! Look at these! Yeah. Look at these sloppy these drunks!" Okay, yeah. but right? Okay, this this is true all around the world. Terrorism is is almost always the tool of the dominated. Like this is what th this is what they have left in their arsenal, and I'm not saying well, that clarify. they might have some goofy beliefs that also go along with that. Because when people get desperate, they tend to cling and to whoever the most radical person around trying now, to recruit them is. Let's clarify: the George Bushian terrorism was insurgents and militants have attacked our military. That's terrorism. They call it a terror attack when a bomb is planted in a military. Hold on. Yeah. If our military is being attacked by foreign fighters in a foreign country that we invaded. That's not terrorism. Right. They're calling it that because they want to win a political point. Terrorism is, why did Hamas target the music festival? They, that, that's terrorism. Yeah. Targeting civilians intentionally sure. for the purpose they, of gaining leverage over your enemy, terrorizing the people in the country to win political power. They, sure. they, want, they want to inflict that is terrorism. They want to inflict as much damage I mean as possible on civilians because they know that the reaction will be catastrophic, and because of that, the rest of the Arab world and the Muslim world may rally to the defense. That is the ex that is exactly what Hamas, terrorism is is designed to do. Be Blumenthal said, Max Blumenthal said that Hamas targeted the music festival as a target of opportunity, knowing they could use civilians as leverage against the Israeli government. And uh, I think the general assessment is Hamas wanted to disrupt the Abraham Accords. And they wanted to force, like the United States, what did they do? But Biden promises $100 million to the Strip and the West Bank, of which a lot of that will flow into the hands yeah, of Yeah, but look, I mean, again, and this is, uh, just to be clear here, if, I, if you ever say, put yourself in their shoes, this is not saying, therefore, they're right about everything. I'm just saying, to understand the situation, what were the Abraham Accords really, okay? For years, okay, even under, uh, when I was a kid, under Yitzhak Rabin, uh, who was the prime minister of Israel. The and, and from way before then, the entire framing of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians was basically that, look, there is this resentment within the Arab world that Israel illegitimately got this land and kicked all of these Muslims off of this land to create their country, and then continued, not only did they take what the UN partition uh, recommendation recommended by force, but then they took way more than that, and then way more than that by war, and this isn't right, and all these Arabs are, should be allowed to return. That's their perspective, okay? And forever, and all the way up to Yitzhak Rabin in the 90s, the idea was that, look, we have to either make peace or kind of pretend to make peace or at least act as if we're offering a two-state solution here before we can ever make peace with the broader Arab world. The Netanyahu strategy was to go, screw that. Yep. We're never making peace with these Palestinians. You'll never get your state. We're going to support Hamas just so you don't get your state. And what we're going to do is try to buy off with U.S. taxpayer dollars the rest of the Arab world to abandon your cause and recognize us and normalize relationships with us even though we will never give you your state. Wait, wait, wait. Is, is that so, bad? Well, I'm not saying, forget even the more, yes, I do think it's bad, but forget even the moral judgment for a second. I'm saying put yourself in the shoes of the Palestinians. This deal is now to buy off your last lifeline which would be these surrounding Arab countries yep. and that you will never get you, you. There's no more hope. You will be dominated forever. So of course they would want to break up. Those, yeah, well, those, and, those, and what those do people deals. without so, hope do? Yeah. Radical right. things. And, and my point is just the distinction between the George Bushy and description of terrorism when they say, oh, some Iraqis just blow up a truck. They're, they're terrorists. It's like, well, dude, you're you're an invading military force in a country. Right. That so you're saying want they're defending there. themselves versus people who are aggressive. Well, against I, I, I'm not even saying citizens. defending themselves. I'm saying military action is different from people civilians targeting civilians explicitly sure. totally for, agree. For, for, for gain. So, oh, I completely agree but, with but, that. But I'm, and I, yeah. I'm not even saying you don't have to define them the way I'm defining. I'm saying there's a distinction between the two. Sure. And yes. typically in American foreign policy, they say, oh, what, when, when people refer to the George Bush era definition of terrorism, when they when they were saying things like you'll get terrorism, well, they, they, they were talking in the news about Iraqis or Afghanis bombing U.S. military targets. And then the media would call that a terrorist attack.
because it scared people in the same way 9-11 did. Sure, no, but when I was referring to Pat Buchanan's quote, he was talking about 9-11. Right, right. He was talking about the African embassy He's bombings. About and so, like, so I get your point. Look, yeah. if you're they, fighting they, off an invading army is a very different thing than what, attacking people in a country that's dominating what, your country. What I, what I, what I, what I guess the, the broader point is 9-11 was a terrorist attack. They attacked civilian targets. They killed thousands of civilians. And then that freaked Americans out to a great degree. Yep. The U.S. then invades, for some reason, Iraq, <laughs> whatever. And when the Iraqis resist, the reason they call it terrorism is to invoke the same sense of dread and fear in Americans yes. that they felt from 9-11. Yeah, Even though right. it's a military. Which yeah, is, just, I think, I which think is that's absurdly right. unfair to the Iraqis who had every right to defend themselves from the American empire that was attacking them for no reason at all. In hindsight, zero well, well, reason. There's a reason. Oh, please. Yeah, we set up military bases in Iraq and Afghanistan surrounding Iran because we also want to attack yeah. Iran. Well, that's, Bingo. Well, that's right. There, <laughs> there were a lot it. of reasons. But look, yeah, I think... Yeah, the reasons I are think, not good ones. Yeah. I, I think like... like and, and this is what I try to say with this when you first start. If you're, if you're trying to first start understanding the whole thing, and then... Because you got to understand it before you can really know what the correct policy is. But if you understand... Because really... Like, I remember... Um, there there was... I was on a... I used to... Uh, I was a contributor on SE Cup show... Uh, which she had a show on uh, on on CNN, CNN back in uh, this was like in 2017 or something like that. And there was like this. I'm little... such an OG Dave Smith fan. I watched every single episode. <laughs> well, you're one of the 17 people who watched that show. Well, that's me, buddy. Go, that's it me. It didn't go great, but it was good money. It was a good time, and I, I you know, it was it was fun for me at the time. Um, but there was this ISIS attack in New York City, and a very on the scale of terrorism, a very minor one. I mean, it, it was I I don't was even a remember truck the crash. I think. Yeah, it was a truck crash, and oh, he the jumped out, crashed. and he he hit someone with the van then jumped out and shot off a gun and he said he was isis but like even that it wasn't even like really connected it was like a crazy person here yeah. who happened to be muslim who happened to say i'm with isis and um so we we're going around this panel and i was just making the argument about how you know like w w you know, we always say we have to attack him over there so we don't have to fight him over here. But the more we fight him over there, the more we're fighting him over here right. and how there's kind of this cycle of blowback. And then there was uh, this this Democratic strategist who was next to me. I went off on a rant out of the way I tend to do. And then he just goes to me and he goes, yeah, but I don't, I'm sorry. But so you're just saying we have to do nothing. You're saying the response <laughs> to this is we have to do nothing. I think we have to do something. And that was all he said. Yeah. And this was like a professional democratic <laughs> strategist. And that was his takeaway. It was like, you, like it, it literally, I, I felt like a caveman was next to me. Like you go, <laughs> you say nothing, I say something. And and I went, oh, okay. Something look, is superior. You should have said getting rid of our but bases look, isn't nothing. Right, well, right. But well, uh, yeah, I, but I kind of looked at and I was like, well, look, but do you see how you're feeling right now? We gotta do something. And what do you mean by something? You mean kill some people? Yeah. Yep. Like, it's like, our people got killed. <clears throat> what are you saying? We don't go kill some of their people? Mm -hmm. And don't we totally understand, right? Everyone totally understands we're after October 7th. What's the Israeli response? Flatten Gaza. Right. What yep. are the calls from all the politicians? Are you out of your mind? Are these innocent? And by the way, I'm saying I understand that response. I understand. Look, dude, when you look at those pictures of, of babies who died on October 7th, I, I look at those pictures, I see my kids' faces in those kids' faces. It's horrific. I think to myself, how would I feel if those were my kids? And I'll tell you, I'd feel exactly that way. Yeah. I feel exactly that way. Somebody better die over this. And I don't even really care if some innocent people get killed. So whoever did this better die over this. But then look at the babies of the dead Palestinians and just understand if for nothing else other than just for strategic empathy, understand it so you know what's going on here that they also feel that way about their kids and I'll, to be honest i also see my kids faces in those dead palestinian exactly. kids faces and it's like okay so once you understand that you recognize that you're like this whole cycle is only going to continue until we recognize that there's actually sure they might be islamists and we're more secular or something like that Not but me. the fundamental thing that's going obviously certain Exclude. Not but, potato. But man. listen, the fundamental thing that's going on here is something that unites us more than divides us. That we're both responding to the fact that our people got killed and now we got to go kill your people. And we want to protect our children. That's a very human instinct, regardless of our cultural differences. I know we got to go to Super Chats, but before we do that, I just want to say real quick look, I'm a finance guy. 
all of the inflationary pressures that we're dealing with right now are a product of our empire. Uh, the dollar reserve currency status, whether you care about the Palestinians or the Israelis, it's really irrelevant for your own family's sake, for the, the, the sake of everyone you know and love when it comes to your capacity to save and invest and retire, buy things. Everything is predicated off of whether or not the American government and the American people are willing to be adults about the situation that we sit, we stand in today and we say, we can't continue down this path. It's totally self-destructive. It's actually suicidal what we're doing to ourselves. So we have to take a non-interventionist position moving forward, not just for the sake of the world, but also for ourselves. And I'll, oh, I'll I, and Can I just say one last thing before we go to Super Chats? <laughs> and I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. But I know, Tim, that like even in some areas where we may like have some slight disagreements on this, because I, I listen to the show regularly and I know that you are completely me and you totally agree on what the american policy on this should be which is that you're like this is not our fight well, we should not be involved on this like yes yes, yes. please that we just Send shouldn't be fleet to Italy like, or why something. why the why on earth are we when we're 30 plus trillion dollars in debt trying to get involved in every single fight and fund every with every other country and all of this but i will just say this because i mentioned the king crane commission before uh so the king crane commission one last thing that was really interesting about their findings because they go have you read this clint no. Really good. You should check I'm this out. I'm going to. Fascinating. So they go after World War One. So the Balfour Declaration has already been made where the British basically said, uh, we it pleases the king that the Jews have a homeland in Palestine as long as they don't violate the the rights of the non-Jewish population there. And one of the things that the King Crane Commission came back after interviewing and surveying thousands of people in Palestine is they came back and they gave this recommendation to Woodrow Wilson, who was the president at the time. And they were like, listen, Mr. President, let me just tell you about this Balfour Declaration. It is unworkable because there is no way that the Zionist project can go forward while being consistent with the rights of the non-Jewish people in the land. And they said it will take an army, they, they uh, a military force, they said, of at least 50,000 people to force this on the Arabs. Wow. And they said, just know, Mr. President, Woodrow Wilson, that you're not only, if you're supporting the Zionist project, you're not only committing yourself, but <clears throat> you're committing America to supporting force against the Arab population to create and maintain a Jewish uh, Jewish state here. So basically what they were saying, now Woodrow Wilson ended up having a stroke and being incapacitated, best thing he ever did in his administration, but <laughs> then he never got this, uh, this message. But I'm just saying, when they said to create and maintain, they basically said, if you're going to support Israel, what is now Israel, you're committing in perpetuity oh, yeah. to commit force against this part of the world. And I think that's something that we have to recognize. It might be worth it, but understand that there is a cost that comes along with yep. that. We're going to go to Super Chats, so smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends. Go to TimCast.com, click join us, because if you thought this one was rowdy, wait till we can swear. Well, actually, I think we were already Ooh, swearing. I've been holding it in once, so much. Once. Wait, wait till Dave and Clint can say all the naughty words. <laughs> and, uh, like and controlled we'll, we'll, demolition. <laughs> All right, we'll the get dirtiest words uh, I can think of. But also, uh, especially check out tomorrow's Culture War episode on Tenet Media, where we're going to have Scott Horton and Will Chamberlain Woo! debating Israel. <laughs> oh, it's going to be fun. But uh, we'll read your Super Chats now. Clint Torres says, Howdy, people. Tim, I'll be leaving the country tonight for a few days, so there will be ample opportunity for others to pretend to be the fastest. Ah, that's right. Clint is always the first Super Chat. Speaking uh, about you last night, I, Clint. Yeah, I've been I've been doing that uh, from my phone at home. I, I am actually Clint Torres, so that's uh, awkward. <laughs> is that, that's you, huh? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just thought it'd be funny if it were. All right. Volciferon says, the Alex Jones video game is hilarious. Yeah, did you guys see this? No. I no, haven't. I, I, heard I about saw it. that there was some hubbub it, it about funny. it, as the kids say, but I haven't seen the game. <laughs> What do we have here? We'll grab some more super chats. All right, we'll scroll down. Uh, Alpha Turkey saying the Osama thing with Gen Z is wild. It's wild is certainly one way to say it. Yeah. All right, Curtis C says white wheelchair Santa is one dollar forty cents more than black wheelchair Santa. That's patriarchy. Really? Hmm. Tian the Husky says Lauren has a lot of passion, but she is unable to listen and understand other points of view. Thirty going on thirteen seems like Lauren. Laura. Loomer? Who I think I think about? they mean Laura because you mentioned oh, Laura Loomer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they're talking about when I argued with you and Lauren Southern on culture war. Yeah, that was my first thought. I don't think they were talking Southern. about uh, Lauren Southern. They were creator of influence. All right, <laughs> Augusto Mimache says it's my birthday, and I can't think of a better birthday gift than having Dave Smith on IRL. Yeah. The only thing Aww. I ask for is Dave's Trump impression. I don't really do a very good Trump impression. 
Nobody does. Dude, give me Trump getting us out of the Middle Eastern wars. Oh, Tim does the best Trump. <laughs> yeah, Tim Dillon. Uh, no, not Tim Dillon. Uh, Dillon. Fucking Tim Paul. Shane, Shane does the best. Oh, yeah, uh, Shane's is incredible. Yeah. Shane Gillis. You do a good Trump? Is wild. I, people, I mean, I guess if that's what it's people great. are implying. It's great. I don't think so. Maybe we'll do it in the in the members only and we'll see if I can put it. Right. I kind of feel like I can do impressions if no one tells me to do an impression. Oh, you know right. what I mean? Yeah, well, I didn't mean to prompt you. I'm just saying you he's you're very people good. People are like, uh, so pe people love my Pelosi impersonation. Because my, my Pelosi impersonation oh, funny, is, is just intended to make her sound as disgusting as possible. Yeah. <laughs> that Donald Trump is, is so disgusting. <laughs> and it's not really meant to impersonate her. <laughs> Dude, we played poker last Sometimes time. Those are the best but I like I like feel the same thing that I feel when she speaks. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, that. yeah. And that's what an impression. We played about. poker the last time I was here, and these two were just doing Trump impressions <laughs> back and that's forth. That's true. Yeah, me and Tim. Well, uh, we did by, this. by the way, happy birthday to the guy who said oh yeah this Mima Shea. Day, Mr. Mima, Mima Shea himself yeah. Seamus and I were doing this thing where it was Trump and mini Trump and then I would do a Trump impression impersonation and then he would do a higher pitched version of it <laughs> but then I guess he found out someone actually yeah, I think already Zach did Zach Hadel already did a bit like that we we're like oh, oh that's God. that's unfortunate unfortunate happy 70 happy 70th I'll, I'll, birthday to my dad Charlie I didn't get to see you last week I love Charlie. you very much but uh, hey, oh, happy I, birthday. I, I am the voice of Dr. Anthony Fauci on the recur uh, recurring a cast member on Freedom, Freedom Tunes we should do what happened was like oh, Trump there. Trump was like go. the reasonable one and then mini Trump was like the far more offensive yeah. like awful one who's just saying all the terrible things that media wants you to think Trump would say. <laughs> so Trump would be like, no, we don't hate all. I'm like, yes, we do. We hate all. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. And then, and then eventually, Mini Trump oh, has Trump, Trump I forgot about Tiny yeah. Trump. Yeah. <laughs> tiny Trump like, takes over. He's like, we're getting rid of the big Donald no more. We don't need him. All right. Jesus Crisp says, I plan on hanging spoons with care on my chimney this Christmas. If I'm really good and Catholic this year, maybe Seamus will make a visit. And yes, there will be <laughs> a potato and Irish whiskey. Yet. Oh, uh, I caught the cat yesterday. Nice job. And we named it Seamus. They said they're going to name the cat Seamus. Dude, you want to hear a really funny story? <laughs> My friends, I went over to their, their house once, and they had this like little disabled goat. And they're like, yeah, we named him Seamus. And they were like convincing me they named it Seamus. Turns out it was totally not his name. His name was Giblets. <laughs> but like for a while, I was like, I was like honored. They thought that that was going to make me feel bad. I was like, that's a great name for him. <laughs> I got to read this one. George M says, w WTF is going on. Left wing civil war, right wing civil war. Seamus on Timcast. No elections. Boys can be girls. Kids praising terrorists. And all I really want to know is what does she bring to the table? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If you guys want to understand that reference, go over to youtube.com slash freedom tunes check out our newest cartoon i think you'll enjoy it so now i'm gonna get to the point part of the show where i only read the super chats that agreed with me so, okay uh, sorry right. that's I a good call like, i like <laughs> let's go no but uh it, there, there is one and uh we'll see uh, there's there's certainly a lot that are calling me stupid our good friend real hydro is just calling me the lowest iq guy in the room so respect uh <laughs> we appreciate the money i'm not your buddy guy says tim is more right thumbs up uh then uh, tim is more right than you think sadly then uh, Real Hydro says Tim is an idiot and low IQ, so we'll definitely make sure we get some of those in. And uh, let, me, let me try and find a good one. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Who sends someone money to say that? <laughs> so great. It's Yo, such a weird. I'm but, sorry. I mean, like that's the lowest IQ thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> no, I don't think you're smart. Here's my money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like sh Real Real Hydro is a, a regular. In, on the I show. love you, Real Hydro. I don't I'm shout not, hey, I'm send just, more money I'm to just, Tim to tell him how dumb I'm he is. I'm just please. teasing. Oh, but but he 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 probably gives us like a hundred bucks a day to insult me. <laughs> That's and awesome. I'm just, I'm just like, all right. There's yeah, a yeah. weird <laughs> subscribe to Liberty Lockdown Hydro. I need your money. <laughs> I'll tell you though, there's a weird relationship with the whole internet and everything. It's something the mix between like anonymity and internet shows where I know people who will literally like do the same thing, like insult me on Twitter every day, but then there'll be like this thing, like they'll be like, ah, Dave's such an idiot. At one minute, uh, at one hour yes. and 13 minutes on his last episode, he said this, which is totally wrong. And you're like, dude, you're a fan. I've got the turn. You're an hour and 13 <laughs> minutes into this. Like, yeah. what is this relationship where you consume all of my content and then try to, like, hurl insults so at strange. me the next I, day? It's like, imagine, like, when we were a kid, if we could just be like, oh, Larry David, that last episode of Seinfeld sucked. <laughs> and I'm just, I mean, here's 20 bucks, but, like, I really think, like, like you should have tied the I show I want to buy the DVD box way. set, but you're a but real like, bum, though. It's so bizarre. The whole I thing is so the term, bizarre. The, it, it's a para-antisocial relationship. Yeah, they're yeah. trying it goes to beyond parasocial. They try to okay. incite uh, you to respond because they want to hear you respond to them. It gives people like, I do exist, I am something. But I found if you respond to the negativity, then they're like, that's what gets his attention. They'll do more of that. That's a good point. You know what so Ryan I don't Long said to me? 
This is a hilarious... Ryan Long, we were talking after the show at one point. He's like, I'm pretty sure after two years, no one has fans anymore. They all just hate you and yeah. talk crap about you in your comments section. I was like, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. Uh, yeah, brutal. there's so, something to that. So uh, here Can't we have... relate. <laughs> Michael O. Pinkerton says, watching Dave calmly speak while Tim is shouting makes me even more disappointed that he couldn't run for president. Yeah. Oh. Well, I, all right. To be fair, I don't think Tim was shouting, was he? No, but I'm going to read that. I'm going to read that one because I'm that? also disappointed. Have you found peace with your decision not to run? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a, it was a big, it was a big decision and there's definitely a, it was a tough one. You know, there's like a lot of decisions like we all have in our careers, you know, we kind of got to make decisions of like, okay, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do this moving forward. And I've always been pretty good about, um, you know, like, okay, I'm not going to live in the past. I made yeah. this decision. Close and that just door. Gonna, uh, yeah. th this one was hard. I was very seriously considering it for quite a while. And then just when it was time to like be like, okay, I got to officially make the decision. There was just a lot of family stuff going on that I was just like, I don't think this is the right thing. And I'm, before I'm anything else, I'm a husband and a father. And so that was kind of like what I, the side I aired on. But look, man, I'm, I feel bad in the sense that I disappointed. I know there were a lot of people who wanted me to, but I'm, I'm nothing but blessed and fortunate. I have uh, an amazing family. I have an amazing career. I get to do everything I love to do. So I, I love where I am. Um, and also, I, I still do think that, like, I still do really think the Libertarian Party is going to do incredible things. I think the Mises Caucus has been an incredibly successful movement. I'm supporting Michael Rechtenwald uh, for president. I think he's a great candidate, by far the best candidate uh, running. And I think he's going to be the Libertarian nominee. So, you know, it, it wasn't in the cards for 2024. I appreciate all the people who were very enthusiastic and supportive, particularly you, Tim, who were always, I know you were like way in on the day. Waiting Smith, for you Michael to announce. Malice Come on, thing. man. Yeah. And I appreciate that. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Particularly Tim Pool. Clint Russell was just like dying to see you running. I, I think you can wait, do. I'm sorry. Clint, were you on this episode? <laughs> yeah. I didn't even. Yeah. Use, oh, my yeah. God. Hello. Like, Clint Ru Liberty Lockdown. Oh, I, I know you. What's up, buddy? Right. Gandhi yes, didn't, <laughs> didn't need to be president to change the world. Like, you can be. He just needed to sleep with nine year olds and, in his bed. So, oh, <laughs> would, you consider, my God. would you consider a. Well, I'm sorry, guys. It's history. We, would you help? Well, I got to read some more super chats. I'm yeah, sorry. Let's, you, let's, we got we got the members only coming up. I'll in a ask second, you later. But I want to try and get as many people in. Um, uh, Doctor, or is it D Radmax says Tim, uh, to remind you of your own words. The left has no values. They're just spewing new thing. And I actually think that's fair to say. Seeing a lot of these leftists blindly just claim that Bin Laden was right without actually knowing what they're talking about is maybe not absolutely because uh, some of these videos are from people who say they're muslim from muslim countries and they're surprised now that this video is coming out or this, right. this letter is coming out but some of these people are just like dude you did not read that letter. well no, yeah clearly. but you know but again the, the point i'm trying to make is i almost see this as consistency on their part like, do you remember <laughs> like do you remember yeah. uh when james consistently remember, right right no I james agree, Lindsay I agree, like reprinted mine yeah, yeah, yeah. no, 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 and but, they but, agreed with it you know this, what i mean this, like this, those, this, this is my point you're right right yes yeah, so, okay. the, the wokeness is the social orthodoxy of the liberal of the left liberal faction right They're, that that's it and so that means when you know even to james when james Lindsay is like well the left believes these things and these things i'm like no 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 they don't that's why why is it that the same people who are you know woke are also flying ukrainian flags whatever right. current thing is they, yeah. that, that's, and, and and you know one of the things, and one of the things yeah. that's really kind of like uh entertaining in a dark way is that the debate on the left right now when you have like kind of leftist like uh jews or leftist like pro-israeli types versus leftist pro-palestinian types is that they've all there's so much atrophy from like the last like 15 years that they can't even have a debate so all they have to do is try to out woke each other yeah. You know what I mean? Like the, the Jews will be like, we're the oppressed minority. And then they'll be like, no, we're the oppressed minority. Like you should be canceled. No, you should be canceled. <laughs> and it's like, the, this is the only tool they have left in their tool belt. It's really, it's sad. To it say. puts me in a terribly I mean, challenging position to try and make the Palestinian argument without being categorized as one of these people, because I don't have like anything in com common with them otherwise, but I think they happen to be right just for the wrong reasons. X, Y, and Z says you fail to understand that Islam's goal is to subjugate everyone to Islam. It is not a, ba uh, a banal live and let live ideology. It's like communism. You're right. They are so freaking horrible. And let me tell you something about how much better our culture is, is that the United States of America would never try to subjugate the rest of the world <laughs> to our goals, right? I mean, like, come on, dude. It's like, it's so easy to just pass this blame well, off but, but, on some on, other culture on. while we're doing it. Yeah. Who's actually and, taking and over the world? If they had the ability, and, and they'd me... try to conquer us. It's like, as we conquer all of them. Dude, but what part of the point. world? There are, there are a couple sections 
Americans on the freaking globe <laughs> but that the U.S. The empire. Points. But I'm just saying, a couple sections on the globe that the U.S. empire doesn't dominate, and we are every single day demonizing them, trying yep. to move in on dominating and them. This so I'm sorry. Doesn't change Any, anything. No, I'm not saying it does. But no American gets to just point the finger over at them and say you don't understand the nature of their ideology. And I agree. Sorry. So screw I, that. I uh, uh, and I agree with uh, uh, to a great degree this comment that it is it, it, uh, a lot like communism and it's different because it's a religion and communism is just people trying to steal power eh, whereas, communism is kind of a religion too but sure i get your but, point but i mean like one's got a god at least like, yes, and one's yes, got scripture yes, yes. and uh, um, marks, but my, my my thing is and i'll say this about israel having power doesn't make you inherently wrong or evil Agreed. It's, it's, it's it's what you're doing and so for the sure. united states it uh, i agree with you the u.s is doing all of these things it is bad it would be bad if anyone else did it and so we shouldn't be doing it yeah, 100%. Agreed. But it's just like kind of a weird thing where like, it's like if you, I don't know, like if you were like taking away, like kicking like a schizophrenic person out of their house and as you're kicking them out of their house, you're going, you know that that guy wants to take my house? <laughs> it's like, yeah, but you're actively taking his house. Like, well, how do you get to do that? So and bizarre. so I'm not even denying that. Yeah, there's radical Islamists who would totally love to take over the world and take over and enforce Sharia law on the whole world. Okay, there's no threat of that happening. Right. So let's deal with reality. Yep. All, All right, let's read some more. What do we have here? What do we have here? Um, Ryan Renner says Ian's Tim cast coffee should be the instant freeze dried crystals since you love crystals so much. That's funny. I don't like instant coffee though. <laughs> I want a low acidity, maybe coffee, something like that. How would we do that? Like a dark roast? Well, there's just certain types. I don't know how they're made, but certain types of coffees are very low acidity. You can avoid the, uh, the burn. I gotta, I gotta give mm. an honorable mention as, as we do, because you were talking about, you saw what Bethany Mandel tweeted, right? I don't think so. She said the only, I'm a paraphrasing, the only reason not to nuke Gaza is that the fallout would, would harm oh, Israelis. Yeah. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. It's I like, mean, okay. there's certainly not sane well, that's happening. And, and, and look, I mean, and, and Lindsey Graham saying, you know, turn Gaza to glass or flatten Gaza and all this stuff. Look, there's horrible rhetoric on all sides Lindsay, coming out Lindsay, of this. Lindsey so like, Graham saying, with or without evidence, we should, we should bomb, bomb around. around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dude, Which is really, talk, I mean, talk, look, Lindsey Graham is as crazy as any jihadist. As oh, any yeah. jihadist. He's absolutely out of his mind. He's been in power forever. Yeah, Crazy. I mean, again, I, it, and that's not to give cover to one side to point no. out the other, but it's like to point yeah, out look, how crazy both sides there's are. Crazy, but you will see within like kind of the corporate media where there's so much attention paid. In fact, people will go on and it'll just be like, they said river to the sea. What does river to the sea really mean to you? And then someone will be like, well, okay, look, I mean, it could mean that they think all of Israel should be returned to the Muslims or it could mean they want to genocide everywhere. It could, but it's like, well, what does flatten Gaza mean? What does turn Gaza to glass <laughs> Nikki Haley said, that means finish them. That, but what, finish and what them. does that mean? Like, what exactly, like, how many innocent, there is over 1 million kids in Gaza right now. Let me. So, like, what are we talking about? Here, here's, a, here's a good one for you. Nathan uh, Brubaker says, Dave, given that we've been funding Ukraine, do you think they'll be our next enemy? Well, <laughs> dude, listen, you, they. Based off the intro to your show, you have to say yes. Uh, <laughs> look, uh, look, there's no question they're already our enemy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're point, already yeah. our. Listen, the, the y Ukrainians have part of who we've been funding. Are the, you want to talk about the radical right wing elements oh, in the Azov. Ukrainian yep. forces? I mean, the Azov and the, you know, I mean, th this is a. Uh, you know, like straight up neo-Nazi groups. And I'm not saying that's all of Ukraine, but I'm not, look, I'm not sure on. they're going to exist. Look, Ukraine, forget even our enemy, because that is my tagline. One of the things in my show is if you <laughs> want to know who our next enemy is, look at who we're funding, funding right, right now. now. Well, look, who there was just an article this week saying that Ukraine were the ones who pulled off the Nord Stream pipeline bombing. Right now, I don't know if I believe that, uh, but that's a a a terrorist attack on a <laughs> European uh, ally, yep. right? So yeah, this is how the cycle always works. And um, by the way, look at, uh, it applies to Israel too, funding and propping up Hamas. And now look where they are. Well, we're here well, funding Israel at the moment. When we, sure are. we had Maj Nawaz on, he made a really interesting point about this where he said, what we're essentially doing is we are arming, arming and giving combat training and combat experience to neo-Nazis. All we do, all the media wants to discuss is radicalization and how there's going to be some kind of far right uprising in the United States. <laughs> Look, we're actually doing it here literally like arming see, here's, Nazis. Here's, here's, the important, here's the important point, though. We've been but, doing but the, that in, in the Wahhabi is, sect of Islam forever. But my That's point what we is do. also like the, the and the point Majid was making is after the war in Ukraine is over, Azov does not disappear. 
you still have a bunch of neo-Nazis who have combat training. Well, combat. To be, combat to be fair, uh, a fair amount of them have disappeared. Yeah, thanks yeah, to Vladimir yeah, Putin. Yeah. But uh, that's but yes, and you're you know, and it's pretty funny that like you know. Uh, the same people who call anyone right of center who disagrees with them a neo-Nazi here, who have supported this, you know, propping up of the Ukrainian side of this proxy war, were, make nothing but excuses for them. It's not like stop. I've literally seen, uh, what's her name? Uh, Kathy uh, was the one who debated Scott uh, Horton. Kathy Kathy Young. Young. Uh, yeah. And she's and she's the most like goes after all these right wingers, writes for like Bulwark or whatever. And Scott Horton at one point brought up like. At, at the Azov Battalion, and he was like, uh, he goes, uh, he brings up the Azov Battalion, and she goes, I don't want to discuss the Azov Battalion right now. And he he's goes, like, of course you of don't. Of course you don't, you dumb <laughs> and, dumb. <laughs> and then she goes, but it's so funny because she'll attack any right-wing group like here in the United States of America, and she's like, Yes, was the group founded by a Nazi? Um, yes, it's true, <laughs> but they later moved away from that. <laughs> it's, Nazi. it's like so now I, was, I watched it live. By the way. Any Trump supporter is a Nazi, but a, a literal neo-Nazi guy, like yep. a guy walks by with a swastika tattoo on your neck, and you're like, tattoos don't really mean that much. You know, it's just it's goofy. It was incredible. No, it's true. It's true. It's very sad. But it, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, and it's actually a point I was going to make while you guys were talking, but you made it before I could get to it, which is basically that their only assessment of morality in any given situation is what the power dynamic is. And so in this instance, because the Nazis in Ukraine are on the other side of the power dynamic, they're not actual Nazis. Like Nazi means in power for whatever reason. Anytime any like Nazi actually just means bad, like Nazi, yeah. right wing, bigot, bigoted, homophobe. Right. Those Racist. words all yeah. just mean well, it's, bad. It's also crazy, like how w one of the things that's really kind of funny is that the big claim of the people, look, I'd say just like the majority of the political establishment was supporting Ukraine mm -hmm. in this war and is now supporting Israel in I their war. It. And in the Ukrainian war, they go, Vladimir Putin cannot take territory by war. Right. right. And then they go, Israel has a right no, to no. defend itself. No, no. And you're no. like, how did they get all their territory? George, by George, war. George W. Bush's Freudian slip. Oh. Where he was oh, roasting man. Vladimir Putin oh, and said, and, so good. and launching an unjust invasion of Iraq. And he goes, I mean, <laughs> he goes, <laughs> oops, you can even see in that moment where he was like, hey, I'm going to go to hell. I got, a, oh I, got I got one last one for you that will uh, light a fire under you before we go. All right. Legama says, bottom line, the modern West is the primary force which prevents the rebirth of the Rashidun Caliphate. People like UBL oh will God. never forgive the West for that. And the West should never seek forgiveness for this. The West must keep the Caliphate down at all costs. Okay. Well, then here would be a good idea. <laughs> a well, listen, well, listen, if you, if the idea is to keep the caliphate down at all costs, may I humbly suggest a policy of not funding them. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> of not funding, arming, training, and propping them up, which, by the way, is what we did, not just in 1979 and 1980 to try to take out the Soviets in Afghanistan, right? We funded the Mujahideen, the precursor to Al-Qaeda, but that... And this really started with the George W. Bush administration in around 2006 after their dumbass war in Iraq led to this uh, led to this, uh, you know, the Shiites taking full control in in Iran. And then they realized they had to do the redirect and start siding with the Sunni radicals. But then under Barack Obama in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, he sided with Al Qaeda directly yep. funded al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria. That's what led to the caliphate. So look, if you want to sit here and say the biggest threat is the Islamic caliphate, okay, why did it happen? It happened because we overthrew Saddam Hussein, who was a bulwark against it. We overthrew Muammar Gaddafi, who was a bulwark against it. We tried to overthrow Bashar, Bashar al-Assad, who was a bulwark against yep. it, right? We did everything and then directly funded them. So how about we stop doing that if you're so concerned about it? How about, about who doesn't fund Hamas? How about We're going to go to uh, we're going to go to the members only show, so go to timcast.com, click join us because now they're going to get to swear about all of this on top of everything. Oh, it's said. been so hard not swearing. So hard, huh? <sighs> so again, timcast.com will be live up in a few minutes. You can follow the show uh, at Timcast IRL. You can follow me personally at Timcast. Smash the like button, guys. And uh, Dave, you want to shout anything out? Uh, uh, part of the problem is my podcast. Go check out my debate last night with Laura Loomer from Zero Hedge if you haven't already. And uh, ComicDaveSmith.com to come see me live doing stand-up comedy by you. Dave's latest hour is the best work he's ever done. Make Aww. sure you go see him. Thank uh, you. <laughs> at Liberty Lockpot on Twitter. Uh, 
yeah, subscribe, follow, do all that. Uh, Liberty Lockdown is the show. Please subscribe, follow it on YouTube, Rumble, everywhere else. Tower Gang on Wednesdays. It's out of. It's insane. Maybe don't subscribe. Whatever. Uh, and then uh, the best political show dot com or we are change all one word on Rumble, Rumble and YouTube with Luke Kudkowski. We're gonna have on Jackson Hinkle on Sunday night. Do not miss it. My name is Seamus Coglin. I have a YouTube channel called Freedom Tunes. I make animated political cartoons. Please go on over there. The new cartoon is, is doing decently well. People are really laughing at it. I enjoyed it a lot. If you see it and you like it and you want to support what I do, become a member at freedomtunes.com. You'll get an extra cartoon each week, and we are also launching a behind-the-scenes podcast that I think you'll enjoy if you're a fan. And uh, follow me at Ian Crossland on the internet. So anywhere, pretty much every day at 1 o'clock, I'll do an interview with somebody cool. I talked to Forrest Cooper today. We went for like two and a half hours talking about battlefield tactics and so much more. The philosophy of combat and the basically the philosophy of violence. It was very, very interesting. Also, it was invigorating to be in the room with two future American presidents. <laughs> I'll let you guys decide who those two people are going to be. And, um, me and Tim. Tim. Yeah. Just, always always just happy Seamus. to be here. Just, just Seamus. Me. All right. Alone on a hill. And uh, <clears throat> I'm Surge.com. I've been hanging out in the corner watching you guys go at it. It's been fun, <laughs> as fun. always. Uh, yeah, cheers. See you guys in the after show. We'll see you all at TimCast.com in a few minutes. Thanks for hanging out.